This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, okay, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting for Wednesday, February 19th, 2020, 7 p.m., Town Room, Town Hall. We're going to start with item number one, minutes. We have minutes in our packet from 20 November, 2019. I assume uh, everyone has reviewed them. Are there any comments, changes, suggestions? Uh, David. Yes. Well, I don't remember this meeting so clearly. I think that on page five, there's, I think that there's just like a transcription of the, the speaker, but there's no language here that I think um, that I would suggest deleting. In the first, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. In the first full paragraph, uh, in the middle of the paragraph, it, the sentence begins, in good faith, the security agreement was blah, blah, blah. And then in the Further down, one, two, three paragraphs down, the last sentence of that paragraph, it would be an act of bad faith. I think that that doesn't add value to the minutes. I think that that's just a real accurate transcription of the speaker and that, that that's kind of, I'd suggest removing it. Okay, uh, any other comments, suggestions from the minutes? And if I don't see any other comments, do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, good. Any other discussion, comments? If not, all in favor? Uh, six. And one abstain because Doug wasn't there yet. Thank you. All right, we'll move to item number two, public comment period. This is a time where people can come forward and um, have a few minutes to uh, ask the board or present something, but it has to be something that is not on our agenda for tonight, something um, different. Does anyone here, show of hands, have anything they'd like to come forward and speak? I see no hands, so we will move forward. Um, I've been requested to not go directly to item three, and instead we're going to go to item seven, a under old business. It's the um, SPR 2019-06 and SPP 2019-03 Town of Amherst Dog Park, 95 Old Belcher Town Road. And I believe we have Nate Malloy here who is going to bring some changes forth. This, uh, it's a presentation of changes and new information regarding conditions one, information kiosk, four, site plan, and six, landscaping of the site plan review decision map, 21B parcel eight, PPR zoning district. Hello. William, um, yeah. I'm on the dog park task oh. force. So I, uh, I forget what I did last. <laughs> Do I have to leave the room? No. no. Good. Sure, <laughs> thanks for having me out of order. The, um, right, I'm returning just to Ask the board um, to review a few things. One, uh, the fence location changed a little bit to reduce the amount of fill in the dog park. And that can be seen on the plan with um, the red lines. And so in an effort to reduce cost and reduce the amount of fill on the site, uh, the fence was, was brought in a little bit from its configuration when it was uh, presented earlier. And so originally the fence was you know, further into the landfill and we, you know, we brought it kind of west, eastward, and north, and we tucked it in a little bit around the perimeter just to, um, you know, change the configuration of that. But because of that, you know, the, the overall location of the pathways and things changed a little bit as well. And so the request here is just to have the board look at this and determine if it's in, you know, substantially in accordance with the plans that were approved. And so I was just going to pull up the next, uh, you know, this sheet. That's interesting. Beautiful screen. Okay. 
So, you know, originally, you know, this was, you know, the pathway, this was a little bit more of a circle, and this was a little different shape, and so the pathway change and the location of the shade structures changed a little bit, again, to accommodate the reduced fill. So the, originally we thought we may need almost three foot ballast on the fence and footings in some areas, so that required that much fill on top of the cap, um, and we were able to reduce the ballast for the fence to 18 inches. So instead of, you know, instead of needing two to three feet of fill, we only need a foot and a half. I mean, there is more fill in some areas in the central part, but because the perimeter fence now has shallower ballast, um, we don't need the, you know, that amount of fill everywhere to cover the dog park. And so we've, you know, there's been some internal arrangement of pathways and shade structures to accommodate that. So that's, that's one of the, um, that's one change. And per condition one, the other uh, request is to have a look at the, um, the pavilion, the entry kiosk. This was brought to the, the design review board, I think it was just, just last week. Uh, they voted to approve it with a few uh, recommendations. And so here's a, a perspective drawing of it. The location obviously is not shown here. Um, this is probably the best view just to see it. It's something that will be paid for by donors of the dog park. It's not you know, emblematic of other kiosks in town. It's something that's unique to the dog park. And so as is shown here, it is represented with a metal roof. The you know, color green is actually, it's, I think it would be that. It's a timber frame kiosk. It'd be an unfinished timber frame. So um, you know, some, resembling some notch construction here. Uh, this is a veneer stone base. And some of that's to hide some of the footings. And there'll be um, the kiosk, the board inside is actually, uh, you know, there's six faces to it. And I was trying to see if there's a good plan for that. But, it, you know, inside the kiosk, the board is actually, you know, three panels. So there's a number of faces that can be used to display information. So the design review board had, you know, comments about the material of that, of the, of the, uh, of the sign, you know, right now it says just pressure or just plywood, and so there's recommendations to have that be a, a better weather-resistant material, and then recommendations for how things could be displayed or, you know, sleeves could be stored on the kiosk board itself, so information pamphlets or things. Um, and so this, you know, this kiosk is again paid for by a donor, and in the plans. It's right up here up front. So, you know, there's parking along the street. And the kiosk was always shown generally in this location. And so I'm bringing back just the final plans. So the plans that were shown are for, um, you know, uh, price estimating and, and construction. And so the kiosk would be right up here in the front. It would have, you know, the rules and regulations, um, other information about conservation areas and, and the dog park. I think that's it. Are there any questions from the board? Doug? Uh, you mentioned that the structure would be paid for by a donor. Right. Who will maintain and, and replace th as it gets older and or gets graffiti on it or whatever. Right. So the, um, the dog park task force is also trying to raise money to put into a maintenance budget. So it's something that there will be funds for and then it will also just become part of the town's general maintenance plan. So public works and conservation staff would help maintain it as well as, um, you know, there's a, a Friends of the Dog Park would be formed to also do that work. So the, the town is prepared to add this to its maintenance load? Well, we're hoping that the Friends of the Dog Park would take care of the, the daily maintenance and then, you know, some of the more seasonal items could be taken care of by the town. I just have one question. On the picture, there's a weather vane, a dog weather vane. Will that actually Absolutely. Happen? It's cute. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, you know, I, that's as shown. So that's, that's something that, you know, the, the dog park task force, they've, you know, they've reviewed this, and this is something that they would like to have. So a, a lot of the movement was just to save fill, but it's to, so the footings, you don't want them to go too deep on the landfill. Yeah, so it, it was both the realization that if, you know, if um, the fence can, you know, the fence can't penetrate the cap, so the fence is going to have these 18-inch deep 
by you know, one foot um, footings for each pole. And originally they thought the footings might need to be three feet deep and they really only need to be 18 inches. And because of that, the amount of fill could be reduced if the fence was shifted a little bit. So um, the hope was that it could cut the amount of fill by a third um, by that's just good. those little changes. And that's the same, I know, for the, for the posts for the sales? Because there was talk, I remember when you came right. about, they are put under a little more stress with wind and stuff. They will. So the, the footings for the uh, shade sails are, are, are quite big. So they'll be, you know, four feet or more in diameter, and then they'll be, you know, about two feet or could be a little bit more deep. But they're, the shade sails are positioned in a place where there's more fill, where the existing contours, it might be concave. So the amount of fill will be graded to make the park level. Uh, but, you know, in this location right now, there's quite a bit of um, depth here to make this level, so there'll be enough fill so the footings will fit. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions from the board? Um, so are you looking for a vote from us, or...? You know, one is just to present the kiosk plan, so if there's any comments or questions on that, and then the other one is to determine if the changes to the fence and the fill and location of the shade sails is you know, uh, in accordance with um, condition four or, or um, yeah, so that's, you know, in accordance with the plans that were approved earlier. You know, is it a de minimis change or is it enough that the site plan would need to be amended? So are there any members that feel that this is outside the, the limits of four, item condition four? I don't, everyone seems fine. So um, do you want us to, take a vote on it or just <coughs> say, yeah, okay. So we'll take sure. a vote. So I'm looking for a motion. So I'll move that the um, presentation, to, oh, shoot. I'll move that the presentation, um, thank you for coming back to us. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that the conditions one and four, um, thank you for meeting condition one and coming back for the information kiosk. And that the change in the fence perimeter is substantially in accordance with the previously approved plan. All right. Great, second. Second. Again, any discussion or comments on this? If not, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Uh, against and abstain. One. Okay. So we got five, zero, one. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you can stay out there. Oh, there's Jack. I was like, is he coming back? All right. So thank you very sure. much. And oh, just one question, when is it expected to be done in the spring? So the, um, we're, we're bidding it in the next few weeks, but okay. the, um, the grasshopper sparrow, okay. the breeding terms yeah. are June through mid-August, so we can't have any construction during that time. So we're hoping to start um, September 1 at the latest and then have a survey done in the summer, and if they're not there, construction can start in the summer, but otherwise we have to wait until September 1. And it would be done in the fall. The hope would be that we can done, you know. So, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. And more okay, so now more we'll go there. back to the original agenda okay. and we'll go to item three, which is um, <coughs> for the planning board, it's a review and comment and it's um, Amherst Supportive Studio Apartments, 132 Northampton Road, Valley Community mm -hmm. Development Corporation. Presentation, review, and comments for the Department of Housing and Community Development on a project eligibility application for an affordable, supportive studio housing development with 28 studio apartments, 14 parking spaces, and site improvements. Um, so I will welcome whoever's here to present to us. Uh, I will note that this is the first time this is coming to the Planning Board, and it's not in the capacity of for a permit. Um, it's just to solicit our comments because they need to go to the Department of Housing and Community Development. Right. So Please um, introduce yourself hello. for the minute takers and welcome. Thank you. So my name is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager at Valley Community Development Corporation. We're the developer of this proposed project. Um, as you indicated, this is not a per point of permitting. Um, so this would be intended to be permitted under a comprehensive permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals. As part of that process, we requested a project eligibility letter from a state financing agency. They initiated a 30-day comment period. You're not required to comment, but you have the opportunity to comment. And so I prepared a brief presentation here. Everything that's here is also 
can see there's a, a website up there available through the town's own website, plus more. <laughs> this is a very abbreviated version, so if anything catches your eye and you want to know more, um, that's a resource. Oh, and the public comment period began uh, January 31st, and it ends in 30 days. And I don't know, Christine, if you've decided a date, official date for that. Oh, Chris, go ahead. <laughs> I believe Nate Malloy um, is the person who's coordinating all of the comments, and he would like to have the comments by the Wednesday, um, which is, I believe, the 27th of, um, is that right, or 26th? 26th, 26th, 26th of February so that he can package them up for DHCD and we have to draft a letter on behalf of the town. So that's the date on which we would like the uh, comments to be submitted. Thanks. So um, this is a map showing where this project site is. Uh, it's this yellow rectangle here. Uh, it's very close to Prattfield um, and it's along Northampton Road. Uh, it's about halfway between University Drive and Town Center. Um, we have a number of maps included that show kind of what is near this. Um, obviously, Amherst College athletic uses, a variety of single-family homes, multifamily homes. Over here, there's a, an assisted living facility called the Arbors. Um, down here, with an urgent care facility, a church. Um, looking toward town, uh, this is really to just show that there are a lot of amenities um, close within walking distance of this property, uh, including this building, uh, the library, uh, a number of social service providers, the Bang Center uh, has a health, community health center in it, quite a range of bus stops and other retail uses. Um, again, going up Amherst Center, we're seeing, you know, churches and Craig stores up way up there, bus stops, bike share stops, et cetera. Um, and again, looking <laughs> down toward University Drive, we're just illustrating that there's a lot of amenities, post office, bank, shopping, Goodwill, um, and another urgent, urgent care center right in close walking distance to this site. Um, this is a survey of the existing site. Uh, it's about 0.88 acres, so a little bit under an acre. Um, it is improved with a currently vacant single-family house that's located to the far rear of the property. This is Northampton Road up there. Um, we brought a couple of the initial test fit plans that we did for the site, trying to we first looked at it trying to determine how many units might be able to be located on this particular property. Um, the entire site is quite buildable. We don't have any wetlands issues or steep slopes. There is a slope, but it's not the steepest on Northampton Road. So just showing a variety of iterations that we, we considered, some of them having more or less kind of build out on, on the site. Um, this is a view of our current site plan, and again, all of our plans at this stage are preliminary and works in progress. Um, it's showing the building uh, in its context, and you know, I believe the massing of the building is in proportion to some of the other uh, larger properties that you see kind of in proximity to it. Uh, this is the current site layout plan. Um, originally, we had looked at reusing the house and adding on to it. Uh, we've moved to a new iteration where we demolish the house and rebuild, partly because we were really pinned to the back uh, lot line. With the existing house, it was within about eight feet um, of the lot line that it shares with the Amherst College field. Uh, so rendering of the site plan. Um, there are walkways, there are 14 parking spots provided, one accessible one. Uh, some of the green parking spaces are grass creek parking. Um, we just tried to make as much um, impervious service as uh, pervious service as we could. Um, so these areas are pervious, the walk paths are uh, a poured pervious kind of crushed rubber. Uh, we have some suggested areas for gardening. We have an outdoor patio back here. 
um, and plantings to kind of provide some privacy both for tenants as well as users of the athletic field. And again, some new screening that's coming in along the side of our single family house that's next door. Um, this is just a very quick overview of the building. Uh, it's a multi-unit apartment building. Uh, it's two and a half floors, 28 units. They're all studio apartments, very small. Two of them are handicapped accessible. The average size is 245 gross square feet. Uh, the total square footage is almost 11,000 gross square feet. Um, the idea for this property is to have all these units be at some point of affordability. So 10 are intended to be for very low income individuals who are currently homeless. Uh, two are intended for low income individuals who are uh, referred by the Department of Mental Health. Eight are for other low income persons, probably working persons, uh, earning about 50% of the area median income. And then eight for persons uh, who are moderate income, earning up to 80% of the area median income. And just for point of reference for, for a single person, 80% of AMI is $49,700. So that's kind of the top of the income spectrum. And then if you're in one of the 30% units, you would have a, a rental subsidy. So you could make as little as $100 and pay a third of your income for rent. So it's a pretty broad span of uh, an intentionally kind of mixed income profile. Uh, a few quick facts about the site layout. Uh, the percent of land occupied by buildings, as you can see, is just under 10%. Paved areas, about 32%. Total impervious areas, about 32%. Open space, 65.5. 14 parking spaces, which is 0.5 spaces per unit. Um, we own a number of other similar properties, uh, most of which don't have any parking. Um, some do have some parking, but uh, our experience with this uh, population group is that many people will not have cars. Uh, we've intentionally chosen a walkable location so that people will not need to own cars who live here. Um, this is a quick look at waivers that we anticipate requesting from the Zoning Board of Appeals as part of the 40B comp permit process. Um, probably the biggest single issue has to do with density. Um, that uh, under zoning, uh, you would not be allowed to have this many units on a parcel of this size. Um, what else have we got? Uh, the maximum lot coverage, we're coming in at 41.64% right now. The maximum lot coverage is 40%. I think we'll probably hover somewhere between 40 and 45%. Again, some of that will be pervious. Uh, fence height, we've had a neighbor request a taller fence along the property line uh, in, ex in excess of the six-foot limit. Uh, and again, back to parking, uh, significantly less parking than is typical under zoning. Um, these are uh, some renderings and plans of the proposed building as it looks at this moment in time. Again, still in the preliminary design stage. Um, so these are a number of views, uh, uh, an effort's been made to have a very traditional looking building, uh, one that reads as a residential building rather than a, you know, other type of use. Um, one that has different aspects to it, is well articulated so it looks different from different angles. Um, this is a sloping um, site, so you can see this is the, the kind of entry from the parking is on grade. Uh, you would go in and it's essentially a split level. You'd go down to a basement level or you'd go up to the first floor or up to the second floor. When you go in on grade, there's an elevator. So all three floors are fully accessible. And as the uh, grade slopes away, you can see that the units on the ground floor have full windows. Um, this is the first floor plan. Uh, again, this is the part that's kind of below grade. We've got laundry and mechanical rooms in this area. Um, on the ground floor, we have common room. We have an office for a resident services coordinator. Uh, we have a public restroom, and this is the elevator. And then it's, it's basically small studio units that are pretty similar uh, in size and configuration. Uh, this is the first floor. This unit is the uh, a handicapped accessible unit, and then there are more units. Up on the third floor, we have another accessible unit, and we have a property management office as well on site. 
This is the roof. It's complicated. Uh, this is an elevation. This would be the side of the building facing the parking for the Conway Field House. Uh, this would be the side of the building facing the parking area. Um, this would be the side of the building facing Northampton Road. And this would be the side of the building facing the uh, track and the athletic field. Um, just some blow-ups of, you know, different unit types. Uh, each unit will have its own bathroom equipped with a toilet sink and shower, and then each one will have a kitchenette. Um, this is supportive housing, so we're just sharing a, a really a snapshot of the supportive services that we're pro proposing. There is a, a pretty detailed supportive service plan that's online if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, essentially, it's a resident services coordinator on site, about 0.75 FTE. We have uh, the Department of Mental Health that would provide services for its clients. Uh, we have several of other local service providers that are committed to serving homeless um, tenants who are moving in. Um, the Amherst Health Department. And then there are a lot of community-based providers also that would assist people. These are kind of the folks who would be actually physically coming onto the property to offer services. And that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Sure. Uh, are there questions from board members? Doug? I have one question. Sure. Um, have you been in contact with the fire department in terms of their access around the building? Yes. I have a few questions and comments. One of them was about um, that they're all studio apartments, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you had considered some one-bedroom units. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of thinking of clients that I've had um, in people who were trying to get um, custody of their children or right. and so parental rights restored and visitation. I think yep. it struck me that some of the, your clients would be in that situation, and it yep. might be nice to have a bedroom so kids could stay over as yep. if that relationship is worked on. Has that been thought about? Yes. So um, we looked at a number of both plan and budget scenarios with larger units um, and struggled with the cost of the larger units and wanting to have maximize the amount of supportive services on site. We do own similar housing with parents who are looking to reunify with their children. Um, we've had tenants that have become pregnant while they lived on site. And we've always been pretty successful at being able to transition those folks into a more appropriately sized apartment. Um, some of them need more than a one bedroom apartment um, at that point. So uh, we did look at it and we felt like this model worked best uh, for the population and need that had been identified in town. So, so because I'm kind of, we, we seem to be getting a lot of buildings with only one floor plan. And I wonder about flexibility and people being able to stay in their apartments for a long time and maybe mm -hmm. move to a different unit in the same building because these are the homes. Are you expecting people to stay for a few years or many years? Or Yeah, we well, again, we've owned properties like this for almost 30 years. So we see a pretty wide range. Um, we've certainly had people stay 18 to 20 years. Um, we have had people, you know, leave after a year. For some people, this is kind of a, a stepping stone potentially to a larger um, apartment. And then a lot of folks somewhere in the middle, like three to five years. So, so I guess I'm sort of saying I'd like to see some one bedrooms because if there are parts of our community, it'd be great that they could stay in Amherst and not have to go to Northampton mm -hmm. and things like that. So, because those kind of ties are important. The other um, question I had was um, another another situation I've been in that came up where it, at some public housing where people where people can smoke, and so the, at first the, the tenants could smoke in like they were smoking outside the front door and all yeah. the smoke was going in the apartment. Sure. And so then they were like forced down some slope to some picnic tables, and so this was like in the middle of the winter. The person was in a wheelchair, chain smoker. 
Yeah. It was just, and I just, I, you know, and it wasn't really part of what I was there, but I finally convinced the housing authority to put some kind of structure overhead so when people are smoking, mm -hmm. which they're usually addicted to, that they're not getting sleeted on and rained on. And it was just, and do you know, I just thought that's kind of a, um, a consideration to me. It's something we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about. Um, this would be a non-smoking building. Um, we have some, in some cases, made non-smoking properties, which tends to result in people smoking here um, on the sidewalk. Um, in this case, we have a designated smoking area for now. This is, again, preliminary. There's usually not a perfect answer to this. Is here, um, it's a bench. So certainly we could consider some covering for it. Um, you know, we didn't want to... <laughs> Well, I don't know. <laughs> you might consider some covering for it. I just saw the dog park pavilion cover, and that just makes me laugh. So um, we didn't want necessarily people to smoke on the main patio because, you know, some people will be non-smokers. Uh, so this is our, our current effort to accommodate both the health needs of non-smokers as well as have a place available for smokers. <laughs> Um, it's, 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 we're trying to get it away from, from this patio, we're trying to get it away from the building, we're trying to get it away from abutters who are nearby, and away from the sidewalk, and away from the track. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've covered all my clients um, that I've had in the past. And Janet, I, um, since you've had like three or four questions, could I open it to the board and then we can come back so we can sort of rotate around. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have some, Maria? Um, I appreciate the sort of forms and working with the context and keeping the scale. And I, I know this preliminary, and I, I kind of agree that the landscaping, there's a lot of things on all sides, and so to be very cognizant of that. And, and this drawing south is up, correct? Wait, let's see. South is to the left. To the left. To the left. left. Okay. Captain Road's on the right. That's north. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I'm so used to the north being up, so okay. So I would just be wary of like when, if you're truly, you know, encouraging like the garden raised beds, which I love, I think that'd be a really nice amenity and be community building. Just make sure, you know, you're not shading it. And, right. and that, yeah, the, the smoking area, that's a tough one because it there's is. something on all four sides. So yeah, give that some more thought, especially because the Amherst the field house parking there, it's a very public space, but I, mean, I guess all four sides really are. So. Um, but I do appreciate the care and thought about, you know, really trying to work with the site and bring the scale down. You don't have it as, you know, massive as you can. Um, right. And I think that, yeah, having it toward the back of the site makes a lot of sense, just keeping that sort of um, the green space on right. Route 9. That makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I, look, I hope you show more iterations, but um, I think it's a good first step. Great. Thanks. Doug? My first question was, are we commenting about this as though we were doing a site plan review, or are we not really getting down to that level of detail? We're not getting to that level of detail. It's just about, because they're in general schematic right now. They're just trying to, you know, get ready so they can go through those processes. Um, it is going to go to zoning subcommittee, I mean, sorry, ZBA. So part of it is comments to um, the Valley community, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Thank Development. You. I'm like, I'm like, the, yep, and to zoning ZBA. So our memo will go to both of them. Am I correct, Chris? Or yeah. The memo for now will just go to DHCD, okay. and it will be packaged with other comments that we've received. And um, we're going to draft a letter from the town manager that tries to encapsulate all of the comments that we've received. So um, the detailed review of this will come later during the comprehensive permit process. This is sort of a first look and an opportunity for you to say, this is a good location, it looks like a generally good layout, you know, um, that you are generally supportive of this project or not. Sort of general comments, um, more than specific comments, I would then say. get into the, the weeds, but do you have... Okay, so in that spirit, um, I think, first of all, it was a wonderful submission. It was 
clear, easy to read. You highlighted the issues that are going to be before the town. Uh, I haven't looked at a lot of these, but I appreciated that. Um, I am generally supportive of the project. Um, and my only comment on the site, uh, the siting even, would be could you rotate the dumpsters so that everybody driving in and out that isn't looking straight at them? Um, you know, that little dog leg at the lower left corner, I'm not quite sure what that's doing. Uh, you know, so, so you don't need to respond. Uh, that's just my only. Can I respond? <laughs> <laughs> so the dumpsters will be in a cedar fenced enclosure. I know. As long as they're closed. As long and, as they're closed. You know. So the, the do this little business at the end is intended to allow the dumpster truck to turn on the site and not have to back out onto Route 9. But I hear your comment. David? I also would like to, I thought it was a really thoughtful and well-presented narrative of the project. Thank I think you. that your identification of the primary neighborhood, that corridor, and I also especially appreciated um, the kind of ratio of owner occupancy to, uh, to rental properties uh, on that corridor. Um, I thought that was really, you know, made it clear to me, being also a neighbor of the pro proposed project, um, uh, that it is really well cited for the, 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 the purpose, as I understand it, of the project. Um, I also would like to commend Valley CDC for the responsiveness to the neighbor's concerns, or some of the neighbor's concerns as expressed and tabulated in the uh, uh, narrative. Um, the, the thing that, that I, because the, 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 the renderings that, that I would like to see eventually, mm -hmm. or I think that would be helpful, mm -hmm. because it is on a slope, and it's on a slope if you're going um, east, you're going uphill, mm -hmm. and it's on the right-hand side of the street. Yep. Just to see in relation, the, the height in relationship to some of the, yeah. the abutting house, the B&B, &B, in relationship to the, those tall, I think they're spruce, I, don't, I think they're coming down, but that's like the sight line, that's the hor upper horizon, just to get a, a better picture of the scale of, the, yeah. of, of, of it. Yeah. But otherwise, I think it, it, you know, I really do appreciate its sensitivity to the environment and to the, 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 the various yeah. neighbors and concerns. I think it's a great suggestion, but a challenging task, because it is little plateaus as you go up, and so, the neighboring property is going to sit much higher, not because it's a taller structure, but because of the rising grade. So you're going to, you know. Doug? On that uh, subject, I've wondered if the town has ever considered investing in a topographical 3D model of the town with the existing buildings massed on it, and any yeah. one that That's comes right. before us could essentially insert their project into the town and then we could have 3D, cool. you know, flying or fly arounds and drive, ar drive alongs. Thank you. Thanks. Jack. Um, so I, <clears throat> this is not a permit. I recuse myself because I did some due diligence uh, on this property, <clears throat> working with Laura, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, I think I'm fine yeah. talking with Yeah, this Chris. is just a review yeah. and comment. <clears throat> I was wondering about uh, similar concepts uh, that you or, you know, a uh, similar agency to, your, to yourself or uh, program where you have uh, the single occupancy um, um, structure, uh, you know, where it is, how it's working out, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah. So we... Uh, we have one of these properties that's under renovation now, just now, but prior to that we had 53 units in four different buildings um, in Northampton, all single room occupancy. Some are traditional kind of lodging houses where people just rent a bedroom and then they share kitchen and bath. Others are like this, these kind of very small studio apartments. Um, and I think we've had a great experience. Um, you know, they tend to be a mix of people from different walks of life some retirees, some low-wage earners, some people with disabilities, some people who were homeless, 
you know, it's, it's a whole range of, of people. Um, and I think without those types of housing opportunities, some of these people would be on the street. So I don't know, it's work that we're pretty proud of. Um, and we have really have not had issues with immediate neighbors or abutters. There were several um, who wrote positive letters that are kind of in the compilation of letters that's in here. Did, did you want to add anything? This is our director, Joanne. Joanne Campbell. I'll just, I don't want to sit next to you. <laughs> Joanne Campbell, executive director of, of Valley. Um, so yeah, we've been doing this for, for 30 years, and I think the project that's under construction now, that's a renovation and expansion from a typical lodging house to uh, a 31 unit SRO, very similar to this small studio apartment, is on Bridge Street. On the way into town, if you're coming from Amherst on the right-hand side as you come around that bend, um, that'll be finished in probably May okay. or June. We'll have an open house. So it's we're taking it from 15 rooms, put an addition on the rear, and have gutted the front of the building. And it's very similar um, to this project. And so we've got people who we relocated out, and folks will be coming back. Um, they're, th you know, they're thrilled to have their own bathroom. And that's a key to this change to this model of a small studio apartment. None of our other properties have this level of supportive services. Um, it's a challenge, a financial challenge, to, to be able to provide that. Michael? Uh, I want, just want to echo uh, my colleagues' support of this uh, and to uh, compliment the proposers on a very clear and uh, important projects that uh, they brought us. Um, like any housing development, uh, it doesn't answer every housing issue in right. town. Yep. But in my view, it answers probably the most important housing issue in town. And uh, I uh, applaud that, and I'm glad it's here, and I support it. Thank you. Janet? So, so I have a question about the existing house, and was the decision to take it down a financial decision? Or it doesn't seem. It seems aesthetically, it's a very nice looking home, and it, you know, yeah. if you just built off of that, it would look good. Well, the existing house it, um, was a carriage house or a garage associated with the neighboring house, and then in the '40s, it was made into a home. Um, it has a couple of additions on it that we would never save because they're not structurally sound. Um, so we were going to be left with a fairly small building. Um, and we felt like the scale was a little off when we put this large addition next to it. I think the biggest single issue was that it was so close to the rear lot line. And there was nothing we could do about that. Um, again, it's within about eight feet. When we take off the back porch, it's about 15 feet. Um, both neighbors who use the field as well as Amherst College were hoping for a little more buffer uh, between this property and the field. And the only way to get that was to, to start fresh and shift it. The other issue was handicapped accessibility. So of course the current uh, existing house is not at all accessible. There are stairs up. Um, and so we had a ramp that you had to go up to get in. And then um, we were kind of trapped in these stories because we were trying to make all the floors accessible that were very short. And it, it just, it was going to be more expensive per square foot to renovate it, and, and it was degrading some of the other features that we now have, a building that you don't have to go on a ramp to get up into, um, that has more green space around it, that has more separation from its neighbors, and is probably going to be cheaper in the long run. Um, I had a question uh, about parking and bike. Um, so you have a 0.5 ratio, which I think is yep. appropriate for this type of use uh, for each dwelling. And you have 14 spots. Um, and I, I think it's great that you have some of them as pervious. That's yep. interesting. Um, you chose not to have a spot. You have a tree in like spot number yep. seven. Um, just wondering why you didn't go with the spot there. And I also, um, on the uh, south side, there's imper uh, pervious, but it's not a parking space. Right. 
I don't think it's needed for turnaround. It is. Is that? That's why it's there. For what kind of vehicle? For the dump truck. Interesting. It just seems like a lot of space. Um, we've had a lot of buildings come forward. Yeah. And that just seems yeah. like it's because that other area to the east yeah. is quite um, yeah. So large. as I'm sure you've seen, the landscape architects do the, the turning oh, yeah. study. So they did it with the packing truck, which would be coming in front ways and then would make basically a three-point turn, put its back end against the dumpster, hoist up the stuff, and be able to go out front ways onto Northampton Road. I'd love it if it weren't true, <laughs> that we didn't need that yeah, much space. Yeah, I just wonder, how, do you know how, they could back up to, I mean, we've seen it all, anyways. We um, had a lot of concerns from neighbors about the idea that we would be introducing regular traffic that would be backing onto Northampton Road. Okay. Um, I'm sure it happens all the time. <laughs> um, the tree is there to break up the row of cars. Okay. As a, you know, often planning document zoning will require you to only have so many spaces before there's some greenscape, just so you don't have this monolithic. So if there were cars parked there, you know, now you don't see green grass creed anymore, you see vehicles. And so at least the vehicles are broken up by having a, something planted, something growing. Very, very nice thought. Um, and with the, so you have other places where you must have limited parking like this, and I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, how does that work for who gets the parking? You right. have 28 units. Right. I assume a lot of the lower income won't, won't have, cars. have cars, but could, but then I also, the like 80%, they sure. might have cars. So um, is it first come, first serve? How Pretty do much. You so we just, as an example, um, we just built a property in Northampton that has 55 family units, all two, mostly two and three bedroom units. We were able to build 41 parking spaces in a zone in Northampton where they require nada um, because we wanted them. Yeah. 33 of the spaces are taken. So oh. basically what we had tenants um, apply for, you know, a parking permit. They had to have a car and it was registered in their name. And so we have extra spaces. And during the day, a lot of extra spaces. So what I would anticipate here, and this is partly why we did some grass crete, because we may, 14 may be too many. We don't know. Uh, we don't want to run short. We don't want to have too many. Um, and we anticipate we will have some staff coming and going, and there would be a natural rhythm of staff coming during the day when people, other people who have cars are probably driving to work. They return at night. So um, our goal was between 0.25 and 0.5 spaces, and we're able to get to 0.5 on this site. Um, we, the property Joanne was talking about with the 15 bedrooms had about eight parking spaces. About half of them were filled. Good to know. So it's all relative to, you know, the population. No, you seem to know your population, so it was just, um, but the 0.5 overall seems appropriate. Yeah. Just last question, so they, great place for them to have bikes. Yep. Um, especially after Mass DOT redoes the whole road oh, there. Oh, we're excited about um, that. But they are very small units, 245 uh, square feet. Sure. So are they expected to keep their bikes? I know you're going to have an outdoor bike rack, yeah. but that's, you know, yeah. rough, it, it, they, they might have a nice bike. And, right. Or do you, you don't have any storage. I, I noticed there's no room left in the building at all. Yeah. For, and so and the these building, are small units. Yeah. So the building, you know, it, in, in actuality, this footprint may grow a little bit when we really put mechanical systems in it. I don't know that we'll have space for indoor bike storage but certainly we could look at a covered area for That's bikes, outdoor bikes. Okay. Backing up to the smoking shed. Yeah. <laughs> We're pretty close to the bike trail. It's one of the other nice features of this. So we do anticipate that this is a really livable location if you want to be on foot, if you want to get to the bus stop, if you want to bike. Um, So 0.4 miles, someone said it, it's nowhere near, near a bus stop. It's about 0.4 miles to the closest bus stop. Um, are there any other, Doug? Does this population get visitors? 
Is that a park, part of the parking demand for the, for the um, building? I can't say never. Yeah, I think, sure, people may get visitors. I read in your plan that there's a, gonna be a system for overnight visitors. Right. And that, so. Yep, we, 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 in other properties of this scale, we don't allow overnight visitors. We had neighbors strongly feel that we should allow them, and so we're trying to find a compromise position there. Is this building, how do they, is it like fob, fob phobes? What, It'll yeah. either be fobs or a keyed entry. It'll have an intercom, okay. a visual intercom system for safety, security cameras. Um, it'll be kind of state-of-the-art security. So that there's people there during the day, obviously that, so at night, if security is breached or there's an issue, what, where does that go, who? Right, so we have a 24 seven um, line that's for property management that someone would call usually with a property emergency. Um, if it's some other type of emergency, medical emergency or whatever, they would call 911. Um, does the board have any other questions? And Chris, do you have enough to write up a memo? I do, but I, it would be helpful if you would make a statement about whether you're generally supportive of this project mm -hmm. or not as a, as a board. Uh, we could take a vote. Does anyone that support it at this point in the process that we are supportive of sure. the project? Sure. Just something general. I just need someone to do a motion. Uh, Dave? <laughs> Oh, I, I move that the planning board supports the Valley CDC's submission to the DHCD. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, DHCD. And, and, and you'll incorporate a lot of the gist of the comments. Does that work, Chris? Good. And a second? Second. Thank you. Any comments or suggestions on that? I see none. Um, so all in favor? And I see unanimous for that. Um, we're not going to be taking public comment on this tonight because. Um, um, you know what? The agenda it, is really misleading. We saw a lot of the population in the room, including disabled people, people sleeping in the streets, who I have problems with great distance, who are going to go out in the cold tonight that really need a chance to speak. And it's related to your comments wow. and related to the submission that don't have computers. They can't send stuff in during the comment period to her. They don't have equipment. And we want you to, students have spoken at Amber Pope. We have things to hand out to you. We can't come back. It's important that you hear us too. So if you could give us at least three minutes or someone could give us a motion. We're not have people, but these people there that like are working and sleeping in the street. We want you to know who they are. Okay, so here's the thing. We have an agenda and it's very long. So we, no, 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 don't, don't argue with me. Let me explain. So what I'm gonna ask is how a show of hands so I could see how many people, because I can't just give one or two, I would have to give everyone. And if everyone had two or three minutes, we could be here for a very long time. So could I see a show of hands of people who if offered the opportunity would come home up, up here and speak? So I, so there's only three hands. Oh, do you, where's the, is there a fourth? Oh, there's one in the back. Um, then, yeah. And then I just want to um, ask either Nate or Chris, um, what are the other opportunities for these people to give their comments and handouts and such? Because we're not, we're not deliberating on this right now. This was the first time we've seen it. So uh, your comments aren't, really very helpful to us right now. Chris? So there's an online uh, portal where people can offer comments. People can also send in or deliver um, written comments to either Nate Malloy or myself in the planning department. Um, so that's for this 30-day comment period, which the comments only go to DHCD. Then there'll be a whole process of public hearings where everybody will be heard verbally or in whatever manner they want to be heard. Um, and that will probably start in a few months once Valley CDC submits their comprehensive permit application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to hold a multi-evening um, set of public hearings. And that would be the most appropriate time for people to offer comments. But 
perhaps you want to take um, 10 minutes worth of comments at this time. So that's what I was thinking, that at this time, to keep us on schedule, um, I saw four hands, and we could do, you could come up for two minutes. I have a and And the time is this population. Okay, so you know, if, if you want to come up a, for a comment, did you raise your hand with the four? No, I didn't. Then not. we'll add you as number five and you can come up. I, I need to keep this moving. We're trying to be very flexible, we're trying to stick to our schedule. So at this point, I'm going to ask the clerk um, to keep a timer for two minutes and if she could raise her hand at the two minute period and we'll go through everyone and they'll get their two <coughs> minutes. And um, so I'll ask you to come up one at a time and you need to introduce yourself, give your name and um, your address and um, to the minute takers and then you have two minutes. So can I see the show of hands again? Um, one, one, two, three, and then there was one in the back, I think that's four, and then Ms. DeAngelis. So um, if the first person could come forward and you please introduce yourself. I'm Melissa Stanley, and I appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to hear me because while you're sending a memo to CHCD about your concerns, I'm here to represent someone who's chronically at risk of homelessness. And as you can see, I'm coherent, I'm sober, and I don't have any needle marks in my arm. I'm completely upset at the bias of this community. As a result, I'm here tonight to set everyone straight. The town is building a wall, a classist wall. And it's very difficult for us to overcome those of us who have disabilities, those of us who are facing chronic homelessness and those who are already homeless are already faced with the lack of the first hierarchical need, stabilized housing. Have you ever come up with more than $2,000, more than one or two or three times a year to get first month, last month, and a security deposit together? Have you ever been told by a rental agency that they won't rent to you because you're not a student or a professor? In this country, you can be displaced in other countries too by hurricanes, and there's hurricane re relief funds, and everyone thinks that's really tragic. But I'm here to say that myself and many other people in this room who've come to represent us are chronically displaced by students. Higher income than minimum wage income. Landlords are currently pricing units above a minimum wage salary intentionally. I've been told word for word out of rental agencies that I've been discriminated against multiple times. I'm also here to represent domestic violence and survivors of domestic violence, where we lose our minds as a result of the experiences that we've had, and then we're judged for it. So while you're making your memo to CHCD, I'd like you to be very, 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 very aware of what you're actually reporting, and make sure it's the truth, and make sure you're not building or reinforcing a classist wall that this town might actually live up to the progressiveness and the intelligence that it thinks it might have. Thank you. Uh, number second, thank you, come on up. Yep. So my name is Emily Hamilton. I live here in Amherst, uh, moved here in 97, um, loved Amherst. But I would not be here now if I wasn't living in Chestnut Court. I had to leave for a period of time to a housing uh, space that was affordable outside of Amherst. And I waited five years to get the place that I have. Um, I was on the Housing Trust Board for a period of time. I uh, chose to get off for various reasons, but um, I followed Laura, I, I followed the gone to the forums and followed this project for a long time. And 
know a lot of different people who, for one reason or another, are homeless. But I also met people who work at UMass, who live in rooms because they can't afford an apartment. One woman in particular came to a training session. Um, it was for um, the housing board. We were, we were, it was a training session. She had heard, she just saw the words affordable housing. So she came and sat down next to me. She worked at UMass. She was from Jordan. She, she graduated here at UMass, and she lives in a room. I'm not sure where she is now. I have her email. I tried to keep in communication. She cannot have her mother come visit her because of partly maybe customs, but if she's sharing an apartment with whoever knows, I don't know who she was sharing an apartment with, it wasn't appropriate for her to have her mother come. She would love one of these studio apartments. She can't afford anything, you know, other than this room. So, you know, and then her mother could come visit her. So she's just one person. But the fact that she came to this training session just to ask a question, where is affordable housing in Amherst? So there's so many, it's not just for homeless people. It's going to also be for other people who, who need a break. When I first came here, I was working five part-time jobs. I rented the third floor of an Amity Place condominium. Felt really blessed to have a little room and a half bathroom for so much money, but I was in Amherst and I, was, I loved being in Amherst. So I'm just saying, it's, it's hard for people here and if you want quality people working on campus, you have to have some housing for them. Thank you. Yep. Um, number three. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving us a few minutes to talk. Two, right? My <laughs> comments are prepared, so hopefully it'll be just two. So introduce uh, Jane Doe, I am a domestic violence victim. Uh, I'm going to use 138 Sunderland Avenue, and I'll get to some of that. From my Comments are related to the documents in the project eligibility drop-down tab on the website, specifically 26 and 27 of the community letters. So those are available. In the letter, <clears throat> 11 Amherst College professors and three members of staff opposed the project in the summer without input from the 1,855 member Amherst College student body. By far the largest group of stakeholders the project will affect. There were 56 signatories in total to the letter, a minority in a town of 38,000 citizens. As someone in attendance at town meetings related to the project last June, I found their alarmist tactics, sophisticated justifications for opposing the project, narratives of criminality, mischaracterization, stereotyping and stigmatization, repugnant to the ideals Amherst College espouses. The college's Center for Community Engagement has involved Amherst College students with local nonprofits serving the unhoused, and the athletic liaisons work with organizations and their teams to help the unhoused and food insecure. Amherst Athletics LEADS program engages directly with this population through its leadership program for student athletes. In 2016, the Amherst Survival Center awarded me the President's Lifetime Achievement Award. The award, an initiative of the Corporation for National and Community Service, honors individuals. It's just, it was signed by Barack Obama, which is so cool. Sorry, I just, it was something, I was so grateful for this thing. Um, for their exemplary volunteer service over the course of a lifetime. It's prestigious and um, it was awarded for volunteering at the Alpers Survival Center over 4,000 hours. So this was a period of 10 years. I volunteered alongside Amherst students assisting the very types of individuals who would be prospective applicants and they're really nothing like the stereotypes that these poor professors portrayed them to be. They're in this room. They're, 
actually really cool. Really cool. <laughs> so, sorry, I didn't think I was gonna get this way. It just hurt. The professors argued that development would eliminate public use of Pratt Field because tenants would cause harm to users of Pratt Field, but it's not true. Valley CDC has really excellent tenant screening t criteria, and it's combined with decades of experience. And I would argue that these tenants would come to the aid of anyone in danger. Whew. Their fear-based rhetoric continued unabated this past summer with premonitions such as, the SRO population is sure to run afoul of many constituencies and alluding to harm to women and children, saying it's not unusual to see a female student running laps alone on the track. There were alarmist pleas to protect vulnerable children from the private Wood Side Children's Center, a child care center, incidentally, with a preference for Amos College employees. The college also offers subsidies for rentals and home purchases to these professors and staff, benefits unavailable to the community at large. For example, the home's purchase prices are offered at 80% of appraised value. The college provides down payment assistance and subsidies not available to the community at large. 10% of the purchase price of these homes are given to these professors for capital home improvements. $330,000 interest free loans and $75 monthly mortgage subsidies are provided to these professors, none of which are available to the community at large, and certainly not to this community. These potential Thank loans. you. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay. Beneath all of this were self centered concerns about a loss of space, and Prattfield does not belong to these residents, it belongs to the students. In November, the Amherst Student newspaper broke the story, and I brought copies for the board, the DHCD, and you to look at so that you can see what the students think. Okay. Thank you. you <laughs> Pam, could you just take our copies for us? Thank you. Thank you. We hear you. Thank you. Um, Number four, I think there's someone in the back row. Do they want to come forward? No, no one. Okay, so uh, Miss Miss D'Angelis, do you want to come forward? No, there's been another eloquent in the room. I don't think they can help. I can go. I can sit, but he has done yeah. Okay, well, t two minutes. Sure. Introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Andre, and um, I stayed at the shelter at Craig's Doors mm -hmm. for a couple of years. I stayed there because I'm a Christian. So it's a church, so for me it was more experience of um, kind of like a missionary work for the people who stayed there. And you know, by God's grace, I was able to actually uh, make friends and get to know them uh, closely. And um, I want to say that, of course, I'm in support of anything like this because, like for example, right now we have uh, a few young people who actually um, have jobs and you know they have jobs and they have to live at the shelter while they have jobs so it's very difficult for them because I mean sometimes they don't get enough sleep and of course if they had these opportunities like these apartments where you know they could just live and rest and all the supportive services they would be doing much better than just staying at the shelter um, also like for example last year we had um, a person who was staying there and he had medical condition, you know, he had seizures. And when the shelter closed, like, you know, people like me who have family and safety nets, you know, we can just rely on them. I can go to a different town, or, you know, find another option. But uh, he didn't have anybody. And, you know, he passed away because he had a seizure. He had to stay outside on the street. So, you know, if he had the opportunity, if he had access to something like this, that would be, they would probably, he would be still around with us. So I would like you to, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to miss the, the, the um, you know, the lives of all the individuals in like evaluating a project like that because you just don't really know them very well. But, you know, there are people's lives on the line. So, you know, when you evaluate this project, I, I hope you just take all this into account. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Uh, 
Sure, come on up. Last one. It's a very uh, simple comment. My name is Tanya Slifer. Um, I would like to Take comment that taking. the Cedar Dumpster, uh, because of the need of housing in Amherst, will soon become a thing of relic for those who are unhoused. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all um, who came for this issue. We're going to move on now to our next agenda item, which is item four. This is another review and recommendations. This one's for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so at ZBA 2020-26, you drive south, LLC, special permit application to allow an extension, alteration, change of a pre-existing non-conforming residential use to another residential use for a mixed-use building, including, including 45 residential units, including five affordable units, by constructing a 1,200, 110-plus square foot building, three stories, a medical office and 44 on-site parking spaces and 20 off-site parking spaces. If we could be um, not have discussion in here, please, I'd appreciate it. People are trying to listen. Um, modification of the parking regulations under sections 10.38, 9.22, 3.325, 3.326, 3.327, Three six zero point zero and seven point nine of the zoning bylaw located at three forty eight Northampton Road, map thirteen D lot nineteen and properties identified as University Drive South, map thirteen D lots fifty six and fifty seven and Snell Street, map thirteen D lot fifty five professional and research park, PRP and neighborhood residential RN zoning districts. So just to state for the record, this is the first time this project has come to the planning board and it's not at this time for um, a permit or a site plan review. It's for us to hear this presentation and give recommendations that will go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Welcome, Mr. Reedy. Thanks for having me, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of You Drive South, um, to give a presentation, get feedback, answer questions from the board. Uh, with me this evening, one of the managers of You Drive South, uh, Barry Roberts, and also um, project architect or architectural firm, John Kuhn of Kuhn Riddle Architects. So probably one of the best ways to do this is to give you a sense of context of where we are. Um, and so what I can do So right here where this hand is is where the site is, and I'll, as I scroll down, you'll be able to see it a little bit more clearly. So you have Hawken Me Hawkins Meadow to the west. You've got the Big Y Plaza Shopping Center here. You know, 70 University Drive is here. The hangar is over here. Amherst College Fields are here. The previous project that you were just talking about is right over here. Again, a little bit more of the site, and that site is outlined in red. Now with just topography, and then um, a, a close-up of the site. So maybe a little bit of history of the, this process as well. So we started this back in 2018, the late, late 2018, having discussions um, with certain town departments about this site, about potential uses. It is zoned PRP, Professional Research Park, uh, but it, there is a pre-existing non-conforming single family home on it. So residential uses are not allowed in this zoning district. So what we are asking for from the Zoning Board of Appeals, and we've been there once, uh, we will be there again tomorrow night. Um, we are asking to alter or change that pre-existing non-conforming use from one residential use, single family home, to another, which is a mixed use. And as uh, the chairwoman uh, described, it's, it's um, a building that was originally uh, four stories, 72 units, um, with uh, I think it was 51 parking spaces. But through discussions with the Conservation Commission, uh, with the Zoning Board of Appeals, and with neighbors, 
we've dropped that down to what the actual proposal is here before you this evening. And so what I can do is not to steal too much of John's thunder, um, but just to show you a little bit of what that building um, is proposed to look like. And so I'll go to the site plan. So here um, you've got Northampton Road, which is Route 9. Here you've got University Drive South. Um, currently it's two lanes. It's kind of a hodgepodge as you get down towards this southerly end, but you'll see that uh, there's a proposal where we were asked by the town to come up with traffic calming measures and so to put on street parking in this area and then to make this a roundabout uh, and then also add some parking, some uh, town parking back in this area. And the idea was that with these parking spaces here, it eliminates the double lane that you see now because maybe a little bit of history. Um, University Drive itself was supposed to be a limited access highway leading from the university down to South Amherst, but never got completed, actually dead-ended right there. Um, University Drive has a restriction on it that doesn't allow more than, I think, five curb cuts. For 70 University Drive, we actually had to go in front of town meeting and get relief, you know, in the form of a, a release of an easement to allow that additional access point. And so this boulevard was actually going to extend all the way up uh, University Drive, and there was only going to be, like I said, a limited access highway. So when that, that ended here, it, as I think you've all seen, it's kind of vestigial space at this point. Um, is a little bit confusing for folks traveling, um, you know, up Snell Street, not necessarily down Snell Street, but up Snell Street. And so the idea was to regulate all of that in the form of this roundabout and then to add some, uh, I think there's 12 parking spaces here and then eight parking spaces here. And so the proposal is for these to be constructed at the request of the town, but at the expense of the applicant. So it would be the applicant that is actually paying for all of this work. Okay. Let me get to the... Probably just zoom in on the site plan itself. And so what you'll see are wetlands here. We, we went through uh, and received an order of resource area delineation from the Conservation Commission last year. That sets the wetland boundaries for a period of three years. So that allowed us to actually do the design of the project. Our original proposal was a little bit more aggressive and it frankly was based on the experience at 40 and 70 University Drive where we were much closer to where that wetland boundary was. But after discussions with the town, the conservation agent, um, the request was and uh, we acquiesced by pulling it out of the 25 foot no touch uh, zone. So that's, you. We have stayed and we respect the conservation bylaws and regulations with this design. Um, also through iterations of the plan, the trash and recycling, which were previously located out here, have now been relocated inside the building that you know, John can get to when, when he talks about the floor plan. Uh, we've got 44 on-site parking spaces, including these parking spaces here, 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 and here. You can see the truck turn diagram, which we've used the largest Amherst Fire Department vehicle to make sure that it does in fact circulate the site appropriately, which it does. Um, we are proposing, I think it's 20 outdoor uh, bike storage areas or bike racks, and then 30 indoor um, bike storage spaces. And you'll see that later when, when we show the floor plan. This front piece, as John will describe, is about 4,700 square feet of commercial space, and so it's proposed to be a medical office. Um, most of it is going to be used by the ophthalmologists um, who would be using it as their primary office. Here, they also have one in, in Northampton. So I think as a, in a snapshot, that's the project, the layout, um, and then if it's okay, uh, if you have questions on this, I'm happy to answer it to talk about connectivity, et cetera, but I'm, I can turn it over to, to John. Chris? I just wonder if Mr. Reedy will um, take that marker and go along the property line so you're clear as to what property belongs to 
the site and what property belongs to the town? Sure, so if you follow this hand, so this is the easterly property line, and I'll go back up, and then this parcel is not part of the project, but that is private property, and so the town land is everything on this inside here, and I'll just, like I'm Microsoft painting, if you will. So that's all town land, and you'll see that this is a, an unusually wide roadway. It's, I think it's 100 feet wide because it was going to be that thoroughfare, where typically you're talking about maybe a, a 50 foot wide right of way. This is actually 100 feet wide. And so we've tried to come up with some traffic calming measures um, to, to still be sensitive to, you know, as you know, there's going to be some DOT improvements leading from this intersection all the way up to South Pleasant Street. Um, we've had our, I think the plans are in 75% completion right now. We've had our traffic engineer talking with them uh, so that we know exactly what's going on here. Granted, they're only 75%, so once they get to 100, we'll have an even better idea, but um, we have been in those discussions. And then, so this becomes just that one lane going this way, and then this widens into the two where you can make a, um, you know, a straight or a right movement, and then also the uh, go west on Route 9. Do you want to do your whole presentation and then I'm happy have to questions, or can we break it up? We can break it up, right whatever okay. pleases the board. Does the board have questions? I see Janet's hand. Can, could you show me the 100-foot buffer zone? And sure. it looks to me like there's a building in it, and I'm not sure how that ha I mean, that just seems off. That's normal. So, um, it's in, so there are wetlands, and then there yeah. are buffer zones to the wetlands. Yes. And it is assumed that any activity that within 100 feet is, needs to at least be checked by the Conservation Commission. So the Conservation Commission needs to look to see if the effect of that is alteration of the wetland. And so that's really more of a jurisdictional mark. And then there's a 75-foot um, commercial no-build zone, a 50-foot residential no-build zone, a 30-foot no-build zone, and then a 25-foot no-build zone unless it's between 25 and 30 feet, you can have parking and driveways, et cetera, but you can't have buildings. And so that's where you'll see here, where, where this mouse is, that's the wetland line. And then this is the 25 foot line, and then on the other side of, this is a retaining wall, and the other side of that retaining wall is the 30 foot line. This is the 50 foot no building line. This is the 75 foot no building line, and then this is the 100 foot buffer line. It, it seems to me that you have a building in the 75 foot plus the 100 foot, and I would recommend that that be changed. Okay, um, well thank you. Uh, we are talking, we're in front of the Conservation Commission through a notice of intent. What I'll say is that for 70 University Drive, which is also a mixed-use building, what we did was we kept the commercial aspect of that building outside of the 75-foot commercial buffer and the 50-foot uh, residential portion of the building outside of the 50-foot residential buffer. And we've done the same thing here. We've kept that building totally, the residential portion of the building outside of the 50-foot buffer. And then, as you know, the commercial portion is way in this corner, so we've kept that outside of the 75-foot buffer. And so we've really tried to be sensitive to the wetlands, the environment. There is a, a pretty robust mitigation um, enha and enhancement package being proposed where, so to get into the weeds a little bit, there are wetlands here, bordering vegetated wetlands. There are wetlands here. These are isolated vegetated wetlands. And so these wetlands really were created, and so I'll show you what they look like. So that's, that's what those wetlands look like currently. They've got trash here, they've got debris, they've got structures within those wetlands. It, it appears that those wetlands were, let me see if I can get back to here, were formed because of the runoff of Snell Street. And so everything just kind of collected down in this area. And so this is isolated, it's not connected to any other wetland system. This- Excuse me, Mr. Reedy. In sure. the back of the room, can you, if you're gonna have, Hello? 
in the back of the room. Hello. If you want to chat, go out and then come back. It's just going on too long. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Reed. No, no problem. Back in your weeds. Thanks. I'm happy to be there. So uh, we've got the bordering vegetated wetland here on the southerly side of the site, and so there's no connectivity right now. Part of the proposal is to do some vegetation within here, a pollinator habitat, and really to make this a more sustainable environment. Um, and if you look, there's over 700 plants on the property as a whole. You've got screening with um, at planting 12 foot high, I think it's Bla their Black Hills spruce, which are an evergreen, they're Christmas tree shaped. I've got photos if you'd like to see them, but we've got all those proposed around this area, um, plus lower plantings, plus some street trees along the street. And so we've looked at pulling it out. I think this is as far as pulling it out as, I mean, if you saw the previous version, it was back here. So I think respectfully, we're trying to do as the best we can to make an economically viable project in a location that we think is appropriate for it on Route 9, which is a commercial corridor, while respecting the wetlands, making them better, and then also providing housing and, and medical offices, which we don't really have a lot of here in town. So it's always, development is always a balancing act, and frankly, we've done a lot of this with a lot of really good input um, by the town. I mean, the roundabout, the parking wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the town. So, you know, I think this is a project that, I mean, I'm proud of. I, I would suspect Barry's uh, proud of as well. Chris? I wonder if Mr. Reedy would talk about how many affordable units will be included sure. in this building? Sure. So there are uh, 45 total units. The breakdown is 32 studios and 13 one-bedrooms. Of all of those, there will be five affordable units. And so those are, will qualify on the subsidized housing inventory and will be affordable in perpetuity. Three of those will be studios. Two of those will be one-bedrooms. And the breakdown really is, I think, a result of 70 University Drive and Barry's experience there, what he's seen just from the market, both the affordable market, you know, what folks, um, where there's a wait list, and it's the studios and the ones, what the affordable folks want, the studios and the ones, and then also just what market rate folks want. And we're finding more of the studios and the one bedrooms as opposed to, and I think, I don't remember many projects that have three and four bedroom units coming forward and saying this is either what the market wants or what the town wants. I think that what I've seen over time is that the town has, you know, I think of the Amherst Motel project, for example, and the town has shied away from four bedroom, four bath units because they think it maybe looks and smells a little bit too much like a dormitory, which they're trying to stay away from. So I think, you know, this is geared towards, and Barry can tell you, you know, a, a mix of folks. And I think that's why, you know, having um, the parking, so 44 on-site parking spaces, 45 units. There are 20 off-site parking spaces that uh, this building will have access to. Frankly, I'm not sure how that shakes out yet. Uh, the town rights of ways and parking are um, the purview of the town council. So we've been talking with the town manager. I think there have been some discussions with uh, some of the councilors to gauge the interest, and I think the town is... Uh, interested in moving forward with these on-site parking spaces. So we've also got, you know, this is, and this is not news for you because every time I hear, I hear, I think I'm talking about parking. We're trying to be flexible and adaptable for this parking where um, we've got those 30 indoor bike storage spaces. Uh, we've got those 20 outdoor bike storage spaces. We're, all, we're also looking to incentivize those folks who aren't going to have vehicles, so through rent reductions. Um, and if you look at the proximity, and maybe I'll zoom out to one of the aerials, the proximity to the bike path, so you've got the bike path right here, and that's Swift Connector, as you know, if you go across University Drive, it can take you to the university. I think with the Complete Streets proposal from DOT, you're going to have biking access up to the center of town. You've got a bus stop here, some bus stops down by, I probably can't go that far, you got the big Y Plaza, and I think there's one by Green Leaves down here as well. And you get the B43 and I think B33 bus. So it's, it's geared towards a, what I'll call a non-auto-oriented development, which is one of those pieces of the master plan and transportation plan when I said, what does that mean? And I think we're hitting on it, respectfully we would suggest. We're hitting on it here with this location and with what we've got with that rail trail, um, with proximity to, 
to services. You've got CVS, you've got Big Y, you've got restaurants, uh, you've got, I'll call it Pot Alley, uh, just down the street at, at University Drive. And so you've got really everything that you could potentially want. Uh, I almost didn't laugh. In this, in this You're area. You're back in the weeds. I know. <laughs> um, so. Terrible. Uh, terrible. No. Okay. So does, uh, were you going to have. I was going to have John talk about okay. the architecture, if that's okay. okay. And I don't know if you want to. Which one do you want off? Um, you got. The floor plan, the one you had up there. This one there, okay. Uh, the architecture of John Kuhn, Kuhn Riddle Architects. The, the architecture of this... Uh, oh, is this mic on? Thank you. The architecture of this project evolved, as uh, buildings often do, out of the, uh, the configuration of the site. Um, this is a very busy corner, probably one of the busiest intersections in, in Amherst. So it seems like a very appropriate place for a mixed use building. Uh, it's a, uh, the, the lot shape as you saw from, from the uh, site plans that Tom was showing, while it's perpendicular at the corner, there's, a, there's an angle uh, on the west side and that's typical of all the lots that go down through most of Hadley. They're all at a very sharp angle. <clears throat> so we had to respond to that. Uh, we, uh, Tom talked about the wetlands, and certainly that was an issue that we had to deal with in locating, siting the building. Um, there's a, a fairly substantial setback on that westerly side sideline uh, because that's a residential project adjacent Hawkins Meadow. So I think it's 50 feet uh, Correct. there. Um, and, and access to the site, we decided uh, not to come off Route 9. It was just too close to the intersection and the, the site was too narrow there. So that's why the, the entrance to the site is uh, on the south, south end of South University Drive. So inciting the building, and what you see here, uh, the, the lower plan is the first floor plan and the, the plan on top is typical of the second and third floor. Um, we felt though, though a mixed use building seemed appropriate here and uh, was required here in fact, uh, it, it didn't feel like the southerly part of the first floor would be very appropriate commercial space. So we decided to keep the, the commercial space toward the front where it'd be very visible. And uh, the angle of that is corresponding with the setback line from the, from the property line. And we, we felt like pulling the the first floor of the commercial space out from under the three-story block would, would, would create some interest for the building. In doing so, um, we determined that this space right here would be a good entrance for the, the housing, which is kind of in the middle of the space. And the parking is over here, yet the main corner is over here. So we created a little bit of an arcade here that you'll see in some of the renderings that brings you to the entrance to the housing as well as the entrance to the housing on the west side. And then the, the, uh, the entrance for the commercial space is out at this kind of point of entry. And as Tom mentioned, this is gonna be an ophthalmologist's office. They're leasing the entire space, in fact, and hope that this space here is a space they may expand into someday, but they'll sublease that in the meantime. So that meant we had the rest of this, this uh, first floor for units. Uh, we have a bike storage area here. We have uh, mechanical space here, and as Tom mentioned, the trash enclosure here. Everything else is uh, studios and one bedrooms. Um, architecturally, as you'll see on the elevations, we, we sort of jogged the units in and out to create some interest. Um, and we set back the entrance here to kind of create a front area for the three-story building and then a back area here. So if we go to the elevations here, this is a wood-sided building, uh, three stories were within the, the, uh, the height limit of 35 feet. Um, you see that the base is kind of a red color and then the, there'll be two colors, this is all clabbered. Uh, the, the bays are the lighter color and then the main body of the, of the building is it's kind of a darker gray color. And that red uh, first floor area kind of wraps up here where those indentations for the entries are. 
And then that creates a wall here that's set back, and that hides the fact that there are 35 units uh, for uh, heating and cooling the buildings that will be hidden up there. Uh, this is a, a rendering of the corner. Actually, we have another, we have uh, some before and afters, I think, you know where those are. So there's a series of, I think, five slides here. This is, the, this is looking uh, east on Route 9, uh, existing conditions. And this is the building as it will sit on the corner at the light. This is looking west, uh, down Route 9. And this is the building on the left. This is from uh, Baker Street, which is off Snell Street, a little bit to the east. And that's the three stories rear section of the building that will be seen there near the roundabout. Uh, this is an aerial uh, looking to the southwest. You can see the existing house there. And this is the building sitting there. And then this is looking from the uh, southeast. And you see the building there. And I think that's, and then this is the rendering at street level. So I think that's just a quick overview of the architecture. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the board at this time? Michael? Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm confused about the difference between the several parking areas. Could we go look at the slide which shows the uh, Now, uh, the, air, the area, I, I, maybe I misheard you. When you were describing where the property line was on the south end there, right here. Uh, am I correct in saying that many of those parking spaces, I don't know how many, are, are outside the property line? Correct. Twelve of them what are. Pro who owns those? Who owns that space? It's within the town of Amherst right-of-way. Okay. So and that's, that's that, right, that's, that... That end. I don't know if I've got a. Now, can you uh, uh, describe the parking spaces in terms of the number of spaces that are in each of the three areas? The area around sure. the circle, the area in the front, and the area behind the building. Sure. Um, and can I just mention to people that if they go to page, well, it's page five, but it says page one in the packet, there was a kind of a helpful breakdown that maybe as Mr. Reedy goes through it, you can, it's uh, the parking management, it says. And that, that might be an older one if that has a breakdown uh, of 39 well, spaces and something like that. It says 30, 36 full-time, nine part-time. Yeah, so that, that's, um, that was a, an original one that we had sent to the Zoning Board of Appeals before we had had some discussions with the town manager and assistant town manager about what is this actually going to be? Are we going to be able, frankly, are we going to be able to lease it? Lease it? Is there going to be a license for it? How is it going to, how are we going to have access to it? And, and so it seems like there may be an interest by the town to meter it so that there wouldn't be exclusive use for this project of all of those spaces. And so I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we can be flexible and adaptable based upon how we regulate this property um, to what the parking situation actually turns out to be after we talk with town council. And so it could be that these are metered at, for one hour and so useful for the medical and commercial spaces. And it could be that these from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m., there's a permit for overnight. And so I think, you know, with that in mind, if it turns out that those are going to be metered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which I... I don't think that would happen. ...can't really anticipate. No. Um, we could control the site, uh, especially given everything that we've seen um, based upon actual parking needs, and we could restrict and incentivize those folks to make sure that we do have the adequate parking. And I think what we would do, because there's 44 spaces on site, 45 spaces, what we would have to do is just restrict, restrict some folks to off-hours parking, so like complementary parking, similar to what North Square has, where 
residents can only park from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., and then they've got to be out of that space because the commercial use is going to take up the balance of that space. Let me just clarify a couple things. If sure. I, it says total, is there still 56 spots? Because it says 44 on site right. and 12. So there are 44 spaces end. on site. Okay. And, and then, then there are 12, 12 in this area, and yep. then there are eight. So that's what, for a total of 64. 64 so total. So that part is yep. still correct. Correct. And four are of yours uh, on the property are ADA. So there are three on the property that are okay, ADA. Okay, so we changed, that's yep. three. And how many commercial spaces? So we need 16 commercial spaces. And you still have 16? Correct, 16. Okay. from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And there's 45 bed or units? Correct. Okay, that's a starting point. Correct. Do you want to ask your question again, Alex? Yeah, and that still does not include any of those around the traffic circle. So these, from if you see my mouse, from here over, are counted in the 44. Oh, the ones on your property are Correct. counted in the 44? 44, 44 on-site parking spaces. So okay. then the 12 here and, and the eight, eight here are those town spaces, which, because of proximity, the site will have access to. And then hopefully, right. because it's being created by the developer, there, there will be some opportunity to have a permit from, like I suggested, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m for overnight parking, if necessary. Right, that's if necessary. Right. And even the metering may not be needed right away uh, because who would be parking there to well, go Well, the, the Where fear is going? that, the fear is that UMass students, because of this proximity to the rail trail and the, the bus stops, they would park there and then just and bike. hoof to, right, or take the bus or bike to campus and then that car's there for a, you know, for a day or a couple of days or whatever it turns out to be. Anecdotally, we've heard that most, there's a lot of students that park in the big Y, CVS parking lots and just will continue to move their cars around in there. So huh. the DPW superintendent doesn't think necessarily there will be students here, but I'd suspect that if the word gets out and it's unmetered, students will end up parking but there. But they could meter the 12 and the 8, and that would take care of And I think it would take care of everything because then there's sufficient parking for the office space because nothing's going to be more than an hour. Um, and then if off hours they are by permit, I think that makes a lot of sense as well. So just to clarify, sure. you have 45 beds or units. And yes. And you have 44, if we, we ignore for the moment the public, you have 44 spots Correct. on site, and three of those are ADA. ADA. Correct. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, Maria and then Doug. Uh, could you go to the perspective that uh, John, you showed that was coming from Mark Hampton on Route 9? Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. uh, that one just goes off of the business. Basically, this intersection is like the gateway to the town. And I right. was wondering, you know, architecturally, I couldn't quite see from what we were given or kind of yeah. how that is addressed. And then basically, it's a three story map. That's what you're using as sort of the, you know, this is sort of hopefully setting a precedent for what could happen across the street. Yes. Um, Yeah. But otherwise, as far as the matching and the, the variation in the colors, I think, you know, similar to the university, it's a nice sort of breakup of a long facade. Um, I do like that where it indents and goes higher and becomes an example, 
Yeah, no. <clears throat> Those are all good suggestions. Thanks. Doug? So I also really appreciated that rendering on Route 9 because when I looked at the elevations, uh, I thought particularly the end elevations, the east or the north and the south elevations, the proportions looked really squat. Mm -hmm. And I was intrigued to hear that somewhere in the history of this project, it started with more units and more levels because I was... I was prepared to say, could we put another floor on it? Uh, but it sounds like that conversation's been had. Uh, so I'll show you what, so there's your. Yeah, I mean, you know, the original. town needs housing. And, you know, if you thought you could sell those or, you know, rent them, yeah. you know, and there are a lot of people who would, anyway, um, that would be a comment from me, and I don't know whether it would go very far. Um, the second thing that I was a little bit concerned about was the, the, ele the south elevation, or rather the north elevation right on Route 9. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the, having the retail or the commercial mm -hmm. essentially not address the street, uh, you know, felt like a missed, to use the phrase, missed opportunity. Um, you know, I get the logic of dividing the residential and the commercial on the first floor with the, the lobby that you've got. Um, I, so, in, that's a general comment about the, the, the facade facing Route 9. I also wasn't completely convinced that, that, the, that the sort of integrity of the massing was enhanced by pulling that a little bit out, the first floor. At the... Uh, you know, I almost felt like the... we'd be better off with a sheer elevation yeah. at Route 9 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, something that was at a larger scale addressed the the road hopefully with either a, an entry or a way to find your way to the entry you know a sidewalk you know that's a different building but but that was kind of my reaction if i may respond so we we did pull it out a little bit as you can see here and part of the reason there was um it i think it softened that that uh, facade a little bit in that corner and also allowed that as, as it turns there and goes under that arcade, it, it kind of knitted the first floor and the, and the upper floors together. Um, because they're ophthalmologists, we, we may have more windows in there than they want because <laughs> they really want some, some dark spaces. And the space around the angle uh, that Maria was mentioning, uh, that is really their entry and their waiting room, so they want that to be nice and glassy and open, but some of the other areas we were trying to balance enough glass that made it interesting, but um, uh, since the entry is back at the parking lot, and I don't think anybody's gonna be walking in from the street side of Route 9, it really felt like we should orient the, the, uh, the entry back towards the parking and try to call attention to it by the angle and the overhang where the, where the entry is. For the, uh, Do we never expect anybody to walk in from Route 9? Well, they can I mean, walk in. Is, it, is Route 9 headed toward being more pedestrian? And, That's and you can walk in, and you, Tom can use the sure. mouse. There's I, guess a couple, I guess a couple of places. So you've got that new sidewalk here right in front, and there's going to be uh, pedestrian bollards along that sidewalk. Then there's, if they choose, they can go around this way, or they can go under the uh, arcade. And then into this space, which, you know, through comments from the building commissioner, actually, this, this uh, was flipped. And so this was going to be a residential, really, access-only portion. And so what happened was, with the addition of the parking along University Drive South, this then gives access to this space, should somebody be parking on the street and coming in or walking from the center of town and want to take you know, this way instead of in front of the building. And so we tried to make it as connected as possible so then it, at the evening time during the day, this will be open, this will be the secured entry for the residential space. You see the elevator here, you see the stairwell here. 
and at nighttime, this will lock and that will lock to prohibit so that only residential uh, folks can access that space. So again, th through the iterations, I think we've hopefully got it right to give that access, especially if folks will be parking there, because if I go back to maybe even this one that's being hidden, you'll see that um, we're adding a sidewalk along uh, these new parking spaces as well for that connectivity here, and then that extends, if I come out, all the way down to here. So if you follow that mouse, that's all the new sidewalk. Then, so access there or access around the building there. Is that five foot wide? I don't know, I don't. I hope it is. I can't tell you whether it is or not. <laughs> it is. Oh, great. Look at that. Michael? Uh, it, it seems to me that whether you're coming at the building by car or on public transport in some way, um, signage is the real issue here. Uh, how you tell somebody where to park, because the entrances from Northampton Roadside seem somewhat disguised. Uh, so I don't know how, what you want to do about that in terms of, of at, at this point. Yeah, I think that's a great point. But I mean, we've contemplated a couple of, so we've got a sign on the building right here. We've got a proposed sign right where my mouse is. Um, we are looking, we have a sign proposed for this area. We're, we're looking to do a lot of, we'll call it uh, low scale pedestrian lighting as well. So a couple, you know, a light here, a light here. We met with one of the neighbors on Baker Street, and so we're going to do eight foot high lights here. We had originally proposed 14, dropped them down to 10, met with him yesterday, and he said, could you do eight? So you're going to have eight foot high lights here, and then you're going to have all of the screening. So, you know, I think, I think the parking is, a, you know, parking in, uh, or signage for parking and entrance is important. I think it's something we just have to fine tune, but it's a really good suggestion. David? I, I know that you've been in discussion with lots of folks at the town about and, and have, ch have had a couple of iterations, but I remain concerned about that elbow at Snell Street and University Drive where there appear to be two different entrances to the parking. That's a, I mean, someone earlier had said that this is, the, the Route 9 University Drive is a very busy intersection and that goes into this odd turn at Snell Street. And, and I'm just concerned about, about safety, about, about vehicular and pedestrian safety there. I don't know exactly where the, there are, across the street there are two driveways into the veterinarian hospital. It's, it's a, it, there are odd sight lines. The, the, the roundabout, again, I, it sounds like it was suggested by town, town folk. At, at, but it, it seems confusing to me because if people want to come out from the parking lot and take a left onto University Drive, it just it seem it seems it seems dangerous to okay. me. Um, you'll you'll and so I'm just I'm voicing that because it's the, it, there doesn't seem to be I'm not quite sure if there would be needed a crosswalk there, but that would provide access to the bike path from that the south end of the parking lot I, I don't again I don't know if, I'm just thinking about the the safety in that elbow yeah and I think you could make an argument that it, the the small roundabout would actually uh, make it safer because it will it, in a way it's a traffic calming measure as you can sure. see from this this aerial photograph right now that that curve is I think people use it as a, as a shortcut a lot to go, to, to go down to 116. So there's a lot of traffic that just flows there very quickly. And I think that they will now have to kind of slow down and go around. And as, as I think we found at the Triangle Street uh, uh, Rotary, it's, people get used to easing into the traffic and it, it, it works pretty well. I, I agree. The circle could be a calming me measure, but there are also two different you know, entry and exit points for the, the parking right there, too, mm -hmm. um, which... And you're just so I'm clear, you're talking about here, and then you're talking about here? Yes. And, and as, I, as I read it, both of those are bi-directional. 
No. It, it, yeah, Good. this is a roundabout. I just want to okay. remind everyone Thank that you. there's appropriate signage. If this becomes a roundabout, then there's the arrows that point you. Mm -hmm. Everywhere there's an inlet, there's an arrow showing that you have to go right, only right. So it's only, this traffic would only be going um, counterclockwise around well, then, that space. If so, then, if a car is coming down Snell Street, Yes. Whatever direction that is, it, coming how are there? The how are they going to get access the parking lot? You would go around the roundabout, just like if it was a road. It doesn't matter if it's a parking lot. Uh, yeah, or if it and, was and another road. again, again, I'm right. I'm I'm going. Sounds to me like Danger Will Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have to say, I get really excited about roundabouts. And <laughs> I've been involved in um, like all of them that have been in town. <laughs> um, so just, it is a traffic calming measure and signage is key. And it doesn't, the first few weeks that it's open, yes, people are creatures of habit and they're, but hopefully they wake up and go, whoa, something's different. Plus there'll be construction for a long time. But um, David, you were bringing up like, if you're coming on Snell and, um, I think the one of the bike paths is further down, but so if you just show, yeah, so this one way up, yeah, and then yeah. the other entrance is right down there. Um, but if you could go to the figure that shows the road layout, and it is kind of vague on the east side. Um, this one? No one yeah, so you, let's say you're coming down Snell and you're gonna take a bare right um, and head down towards the lights. So I can see how that part's really vague, and I understand that the applicant is the one who is um, doing this work, but I just was wondering if there was an opportunity to put some more parking on that side. Um, six spots could fit there, and it just made me think, oh, that is a place that people could park and get on like on the weekends or whatever, you know, park and then get on the bike trail really easily. And I understand that's vague and you probably didn't yeah. want to touch that side, <laughs> but I do know that you are going to be touching a lot of it. Yeah, I mean. that roundabout, there's going to be curb cuts. So anecdotally, I think, and I don't think it's a bad suggestion, and there is going to be construction, so what the heck is six more what spaces at that point? But, uh, you know, from what we've heard, there, there are a lot of folks that utilize this as an access to Route 9 going west, and so if all of, the powers that be say do this, then it'll likely be done. But I don't know that this, I guess we'll talk to the town engineer yeah. and, and some be, other folks. In your to, discussions, sure. maybe the town gets involved with part sure. of it. I'm just saying I can tell by the plan that just gets sort of vague there. Like, yeah, okay, we're, we do the roundabout and then who knows. Well, I think, I think it was, frankly, I mean, a little bit more measured than that because. <laughs> well, it stopped. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it, yeah, I think it does get more vague, but I think it opens up so that there's, you know, right turn straight across, the, and then the also the there's right. that release right. lane for that left turn here. So you have to have an appropriate setback, right? And you can see it on the, that's why the parking starts where it does right. on the right. west side. Right. But I'm just saying if you could just, you know, we're sure. early in the plan. We'll have that conversation. At, and the more parking, the better, right? I mean, it's space <clears throat> that's just sitting there. Underutilized. So, right and they now. already have to come and plow for the other spots. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I think I saw Jack and then Janet and then back to Michael. Um, I just wanted to say something because uh, <laughs> I'm on the board. John, I thought you were retired. <laughs> No, uh, I'm trying. But You're like a bad penny, but all right. Um, beautiful. I think it's a very attractive uh, development, and I like mm -hmm. the access from you drive. You know, it's, it's very elegant, and I do feel um, that that rotary is be very uh, calming, and I'm sure it could be either designed to even calm it further. Sure. Uh, I, I drive there all the time, and it's just going to beautify that that corner, which is usually just it's got a sand pile there or something. It's just not. <laughs> but, you know, like, I'm, I'm very impressed by the overall design and concept. Thanks. Is it, or is it my OK. So um, 
I'm, I'm concerned about the lack of two and three bedroom units. And so the Amherst master plan and the housing studies, which are part of the master plan, all call for more non-student housing and family housing with more bedrooms. And so um, it would be great to see buildings that had more bedrooms. And also, like, if somebody's a tenant and they have a kid, then they can maybe move to a different apartment in the unit. And I keep on stressing that people rent apartments, they're not all students for four years, that they live there, and they can live there for a long time. So that leads to my first question, um, which is, who are the tenants expected to be? Are you, re are you going to rent to students, non-students, and what would the rents be? So I think all of the above. I think Barry's other project is a good mix of folks from Amherst College, um, meaning professors, coaches, um, folks that are professionals in the area. Uh, there are some undergraduates as well. And so I think, I mean, he's done a really good job of just having a, a mix of people. If you find the right tenants, you know, you can't be discriminatory, but if you find the right tenants, then it typically makes your life a lot easier as far as operating and, and managing the space. I mean, I think as far as rents go, the affordable rents are obviously set by you know, 30 percent of 80 percent of the area median income. And then otherwise, it's, it's how much this is all going to cost and what the, what the market will bear. So, you know, I don't know that I can say it's going to be $1,100 or $1,400 or $900. I think there's a balance here in Amherst. Um, and, and it's typically on a scale of the lower your rents, the higher occupancy rates. And, and what I think folks are seeing is that you're able to increase your rents and still reach those occupancy rates. And it's just one of the realities of what's happening here in the market. Um, I don't know, I mean, understanding what the master plan says about two and three bedrooms, part of the concern may be, is there a way to get folks two and three bedroom houses? Because a lot of the times the houses uh, are, are being rented by students. And you get one of these projects where it may actually bring folks out of those houses to return the houses and to return the neighborhoods to the families, which it might be a better way, not knowing that not everybody can afford it. I think that there can be some creative discussions about ways that the town can help, whether there's a, a housing trust fund that is able to subsidize for folks that want, want housing, you know, for. So um, you're not sure what the they're going to be, but they're going to be on the higher. I think they would, yeah, I think they would reflect the market rate. So um, the housing production plan and housing market study do not see the phenomenon of students pushing out families. And so, but there is a call in for more family housing and non-student housing to make sure that there's space for that, including apartments. And I recently had a conversation with a bunch of retired women who had moved back to Amherst and they were all interested in like two or three bedrooms for their families and their extended families. So I just want to put a plug in for that. Um, so this housing is, we're seeing a lot of it, but it's, it's feel, it seems like it's not filling a need or a goal of the master plan. Um, and it sounds like the rents will be high, but you're not sure what. Um, I, I have to go back to parking and just say, I think you need more parking. And so you're looking for a waiver. There's some kind of allusion to data in your application. There's no parking for guests, and then most of you, a lot of your parking is public parking. And so I just don't see why you would uh, comply with a waiver, but I don't have to decide that. Um, I would recommend to the ZBA that they, if they're going to do a parking management plan, that they do one that collects data, and that you have to go back to the ZBA if you're not reducing parking or the need is greater than what you provided. But I just think the phenomenon of small one and two bedrooms or one studios and one bedrooms with inadequate parking, it seems to be a trend that I just can't support. I don't see it in the, in the master plan. I don't see it in our zoning bylaw. I've also sort of written a four-page piece for the ZBA, but I hope we can pass it out. I just don't see it. I don't see the data. All the data I see shows that people don't bike. People don't take the bus. Bus use is down. You know, we have students who are now driving into Amherst to park. You know, students drive. Um, most people in Amherst use a car to get around. You're going to have couples in there. You might have two couples that need two cars. And they might have guests or maybe four guests coming over. And there's just no space on that site. Um, so I just, I just wanted to make that statement. And then I do really think you need to pull... The idea of a wetland buffer zone is not to put a building in it, and obviously that will have impacts. And you're at 75 feet and 100, and you know I don't care if it's isolated; it has you know it has wildlife and you know value as plants, and so we need to protect that. So those are my statements.
All right, back to the project. Um, I think Michael had a question next. I pass. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say I was excited to see the 12%, um, the affordable units, and I was wondering, um, it's to be commended because it's not required and it's being done, so how is it, it how is does required. that happen? So it is required. Oh, it is, yeah. that's right. Because we're requiring a special permit. We'll take so the commendation, yeah, but we'll, right. also, okay. <laughs> we'll also say. Because you haven't, but I, <laughs> So how, and is 12% the minimum then that had to? Correct, yeah. So 12% was the number that we needed to provide. And how do you, how will that be managed? Is it right. the same as like University Yeah, Drive? same as Seventy University Drive. I mean, we're going there through the Amherst Housing Authority. They're the ones operating it. I know that um, Amherst Motel, so Aspen is, I think they're using an outfit out of the eastern part of the state because they've got a few more units. Uh, SEB might be the, the name of it. Um, but I think, I mean... It's still good. <laughs> even if you had to be made to do it. Um, Which is probably a discussion for another day about just the zoning bylaw generally and some of yeah. the things, because I, I think, you know, incentivizing developers is... At the end of the day, and I think I said it last time when I was here for 462 Main Street, just the costs associated with actually providing affordable housing. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's not just you know, constructing it the same as you construct market rate units and you as a developer getting less rent and taking the risk that way. It's also the management of it, the oversight of it. We've recently just had a tenant at 70 leave. She's lost a job, so she's left. So now it's going to be vacant for a time where there's no income. And it can happen to anybody, mm -hmm. but... You know, it's, it's one of those things where there's additional management and oversight of the units that come in at a cost without any direct benefit to the developer except practically getting a project approved. I mean, that's, that's the quid pro quo at, at this point. And so just as you're thinking about the zoning bylaw, there may be some creative ways, like you look at your cluster development, and I think you've got some incentives in there to induce developers to have affordable clusters, and that's a good thing because then it's, spread out more evenly. And one of the other things for the, the town to think about is, is there a, a, a tax that goes to everybody if it is a virtue of the town so that it's not just the developers paying for these affordable units? Right. Obviously another comment for another day, but. Could, Thanks. could. I just gonna do my follow up. Oh. And um, just following up on something that Doug had asked about if, because the architect's here, if the, well, how tall was the building with the fourth floor? 45. Yeah, I think <clears throat> 40, I think it was like 47 from average grade. Um, and so we needed a footnote A modification for the number of yeah. stories and a footnote A modification for uh, the height of it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chris and then Janet. I just wanted to note that a higher building is going to require more parking and therefore yeah. it's going to mess up that balance. Well, and I also just thought the opposite. If you added another story, you could shrink the footprint of the building and have more room for parking. But just it, it goes either way. But um, Janet. So speaking of taxes, apply for a tax break from the town manager for the affordable units and negotiate that with him. That's in the bylaw, not the zoning bylaw. So like, we, like, we, we put that in for a reason. Good. I think that's, that's a good idea. Um, we might be talking about different taxes. I think we're, we're talking about maybe spreading it out over all of the residents of Amherst and taking one cent on every thousand and attributing it to some affordable housing trust fund or something like that to, and, and whether it's, you know, a certain subsidy, because if we're talking about home ownership and otherwise, and, and I know there's a flyer out here for first time home buyers, or do you need some help renovating your home? I think there can be some creative solutions. Again, maybe not the forum for it, but there could be some creative solutions if it is that value, which I keep hearing it is the value of the town to have affordable housing. Maybe it is spread out a little bit more. Did anyone else have, Jack? Well, I just want to counter um, the parking issue. Um, just the propensity of data that I've seen is just the opposite of, of uh, what has been said before. I have not read your memo, Janet, but this is, uh, <clears throat> our bylaw was written, I think, what, 40 or 50 years ago? And uh, 
it's it's a little bit antiquated with it, how people uh, are living these days. And 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 again, my eyes tell me something very different than what the standard says in the bylaw in terms of uh, two spaces per per dwelling or whatever. But I just I just needed to say something. So. If I could just make a general comment about, I know your zoning subcommittee will probably be looking at, at the parking requirement, and you really should. That does not make sense to have two, two parking spaces per unit, not quantifying whether it's a, a studio or a four bedroom. It should probably be based on bedrooms as opposed to units. Uh, Michael and then um, Mr. Roberts. Oh, you do have to come up if you, yeah. Was I uh, you were, and I'll tell him to hold off, but he can sit. Uh, Mr. Roberts, if you can just sit and wait, and I have uh, Sure. Michael's going to ask a question. No, I wasn't going to ask a question. I, I want to, uh, okay. it seemed like after what uh, Jack just said, it's, uh, it's my cue. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been advocating for a, an immediate if not sooner, a revision of the parking bylaw. Uh, because in my three and a half years on this board, um, I, we have granted a parking waiver for almost every project that has come before us. Um, and while they may or may not be um, appropriate waivers, um, they are clearly uh, all uh, assuming that uh, two parking spaces per unit is an incorrect number. And it may well be, in fact, it probably is, that that is an incorrect number. But rather than continuing to grant waiver after waiver after waiver, we must change the bylaw so that the bylaw makes sense for the developer and makes sense for the town. And uh, I understand that the, the, the uh, um, Perceived wisdom is that the town council does not want to consider any uh, zoning bylaw changes until the master plan is master plan up, has its update light, um, and uh, that is all well and good. But I think this board must take the initiative to create a recommend a rec to recommend a new bylaw concerning the parking to the. Um, to the town council. If they choose not to act on it, okay. But we must act. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I, I don't think, I think the town council will be taking zoning bylaw um, before we finish with the, and my understanding is they're trying to get um, a process set because there's a lot of boxes that need to be checked as it goes through that new process because we've never done it before. It used to go to town meeting and now it will have to go to town council but through loops through CRC and the GOL and, and my understanding is they're actively working on that right now. So hopefully we'll see something next month. If we wait for the town council <laughs> and all of those subgroups of the town council to act, we'll be waiting yeah. for a long time. I think, and I say it again, we must act. And then they can do with it, with what we act on, they can do what they will. Uh, and send it to whatever committee they want. But we've got to do it. Because if we don't do it, it'll never get done. So I'll tell you some good news. So the zoning subcommittee um, does have it as one of their issues to work on. And Jack and I are actually starting to work on an initiative to collect data to um, help. Because one size doesn't fit all. That's, that's the problem we realize. This is an old bylaw. It is really, I mean, it was probably in a time when almost all apartments being built were two bedroom um, in general. And that they just, it, so it depends on how many bedrooms, and it depends on where the building is. If it's on public transit, or if it's near a village, um, or downtown, which obviously downtown we don't even require parking, um, or whether it's in a more rural area of town where people would be driving and would need their cars, and, and that has to be considered. So unfortunately, if it was really easy, we'd do it really quick, but I do think we can get it done in the near future, and it is being worked on right now. And if um, when 
we've collected some more data and we start working on it, the zoning subcommittee, I uh, will let you know, Michael, and please come. Um, That's Mr. Rob. Now, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. My name is Barry Roberts. I'm the manager of U Drive South LLC. I'm also the manager of U Drive, 70 University Drive. And granted, we're only six months in, in operating 70 University Drive, but the parking lot there is half full all of yeah. the time. Yeah. The bike rack is full 100% of the ah. time. It's very Great good. Uh, that's why we decided to put indoor, one of the maybe mistakes we made at, and we're working on making the cellar accessible at 70 University Drive for the bikes. That's why we decided to add indoor bike storage here at this project. Uh, but I will say that people are using either walking, biking, or using the mass transit from 70 University Drive. Great. Thank Good you. To hear. Thank you. Uh, David? Uh, I, I, I agree with you, Michael, um, and, and it's good that, that it's going to be worked on. I think the, the thing that we're, the, the parking waiver, which is the ZBA's deal, they'll, they'll deal with it. Um, but the, with the, the th this is a non conforming residential use in a pro professional research and office park zone, which we have, the town of Amherst has very few. Which that's another that's that's I think the the more uh, that's a pressing issue that this project is kind of doesn't address, but that that we as planners or the planners in the room at least should be thinking about is how that's I think desirable that that zone zoning district is desirable for this town if we could take advantage of it, but we don't seem to have many zones for it um, and so that's that, that's another thing to put in the hopper Michael uh, for the zoning review okay. um, well, I think I had Janet and then you Maria. so on page four of my um, thing the transportation plan calls for parking studies to, that aren't on downtown to look at the different use in different parts of town and I think that would be the predicate to zoning change. So the plan says collect data and then change. And so I think that we seem to be on our way doing that with your data collection. Yes. Um, I also um, was just looking at the criteria for a special permit and there's no, um, there's a requirement of recreational space on the site and there really isn't any that I can see and I'd love to hear there is some. And um, I'd love not to hear that the bike path is next door because I would live right by the bike path and it's not 20, 365 year recreational space and it's not on your site yeah I mean there's we'd love to have recreational space back here there is a little area in between the wetlands but it's one of those balances that you have to strike between having a, a large area um, that could induce open congregation that the police department doesn't like um, and so we've decided to maintain that as wetlands, and we're going to put a few, I, I don't think a grill will go here, but a few picnic tables will go up in this area. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, my next sentence is probably not going to please you very much, but we're also in very close proximity to that, to that bike path. <laughs> uh, Maria, I think you're up. Um, I was going to just comment on your... Thing, David about the, the we don't have a lot of PRP but currently like the Amherst Motel project is in PRP and I think housing is something we really need and I think this intersection is also very much suited for commercial and, and housing and could set a good precedent for more mixed use and I'd love to see Ginger Garden go away but um, <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I didn't say this John but if you could just <laughs> Okay, so the north elevation. Okay, I get when you come down Route 9, you see the three-block building, and it's like the gateway. But the north elevation, I think you touched on this, Doug, it's three windows and a sign. And it just feels like you should address the street yeah. in a more urban, strong way. And we, really, we will work on that. Okay, and really I think, capture I think that it's a good, corner. Okay, I think it's a good... Uh, thank you so much. Because yeah. at such an important intersection, it's going to set the tone for the rest of that yeah. growth. If Hopefully no, I, we can you know, improve that intersection. There. I agree with you. Okay, super. 
And I guess maybe as a response to the PRP piece, you know, for what it's worth, the medical offices are an allowed use in the PRP zoning district. And so that was part of the idea of this was to make sure at least the, the, the commercial space was a PRP use. I think it's probably pretty telling that this land has sat as it has sat for as long as it's sat without PRP use actually going there. And there's a couple in North Amherst that have the same thing. And so, you know, I think with the university, a stone's throw and with the programs that are offered at the university, the potential for research development, entrepreneurial spirit, there could be some pretty good research parks, but they have to be on viable pieces of land that, you know, you could actually put and I don't know that you know, this is this this right here, Hawkins Meadow is zoned RN. And so taking a look as you're looking at the zoning, maybe looking at the zoning map. Um, for some more consistency and, and fluidity am amongst it. We'll add that to our to-do yeah. list. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And if I, if I could add to that, to, <laughs> to pile on, uh, I, I think the PRP zone is a problematic zone, and it should really be looked at, because I think the, the uh, creators of it envisioned people in lab coats sitting there, because it does not allow <laughs> for businesses that, that have visitors. And it, no, it, it was meant for research, mm -hmm. Um, it's not meant for offices that, that, that allow people to come visit them. So I think you could change some of the, the uh, wording in that bylaw and it would help up the PRP zone. But the optometrists probably will be wearing those white coats. So, <laughs> you know. That's the both worlds. Um, I, I do. I think Chris and then. So I just wanted to point out that this particular PRP zone is already heavily developed for housing. It has the Greenleaves housing development and the Greenleaves yeah. cottages, and it has uh, the Espen Heights building, which is currently being built. So it's not an anomaly in this particular no. PRP zone to have um, housing. Good point. Doug. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you guys or the zoning experts in the room. Is it really yeah, important? Was, sorry. Is it really important that this is? identified as a medical office does it can it simply be commercial space that eventually if you had the demand and a tenant it could be retail space i mean from my point of view this is a mixed use building with commercial retail close to the street which is a good thing you know um but to me it's sort of irrelevant that right now you have an optometrist who could go belly up or retire and you're, you know, over the life of the building, it'll be something else. So I, I, I'm simply, I, part of what I'm hoping is that whatever orders or conditions or, you know, whatever the legal process is that we have to get to your building permit, we don't just say this has to be a medical office building or space. Let's just say, call it what it, keep it as broad as we could, you know. Chris, how will that be handled? That's a question for um, Mr. Mora, the building commissioner, <coughs> but I can certainly ask him that. And I'm sure that Mr. Reedy will be interested yeah, in that answer of as course. well. And at some point in the future, if you do look to rezone certain areas and this gets rezoned to a different area that allows more commercial, maybe mixed use with varying commercial spaces, you know, that's one of the ways where we're not locked in necessarily because we have to go by the use, the table of uses here in the, in the bylaw to say what's allowed and what's not allowed. But you're, you're already non-conforming and... I'm with you. Know. you. <laughs> I'm with you. If you're going <laughs> to... <laughs> Go wild. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? And Chris, do you... I'm sure you have a very lengthy list. Do we need to summarize or... It would help me if you would summarize. Yep, I have a lot of notes here, but um, okay. you know, pull out the big ideas and tell me what you think. Whether you generally support this project um, is one thing, and then uh, you know your particular detailed uh, comments would be helpful. Um, well, would it be helpful to? Does anyone want to um, take a vote on supporting this project at this time? Um, not committing to anything, but just that the good works will continue and the designing. Does anyone so moved. That? Okay. Uh, or, you, we'll say you made the motion. How about that? For a motion Great. to express support for the project. Uh, second. second. Okay. Um, is there any discussion or comments? 
I'm, I'm not sure what we're doing, because I've never been in this situation where we're just advising the ZBA, because I'm, I'm still very unhappy with the building in the, set, the buffer zones. I think it's the, the essence of a buffer zone is not to put buildings in it. And so we all, and if you're an environmentalist, you know that buffer zones don't work well. And so even 100 feet isn't really much protection for a wetland. So we have a building in 75 feet and 100 feet. And so it's hard for me to support the project as, as it's configured, but I didn't want to vote against it. So you will have to make your own personal call, but what we're looking at right now, I'm sure everybody has pros when they look at this and they have some negatives or concerns or worries, and we have to sort of wait to see how design gets finalized. Will so we see this again? We're not, we're just, we're just oh, right, okay. right now we're, no, I don't, I don't think so, the way it's designed. So we're just giving the ZBA um, our feelings of whether we think support their efforts to work on this building or, or we're not in support of this building. So it, it's not, not, it's non-binding. We're just giving our opinion to the ZBA as a board. Chris, yeah. I also wanted to note that this is going before the Conservation Commission and they will look very carefully at the impacts on the buffer zones. So yeah, right, that's their jurisdiction, that's what they do. Um, Jack, did you have a comment on yeah, that? Yeah, it reminded me about uh, how you said that the wetland uh, was an isolated wetland uh, with the thinking that it was created by runoff from, from U Drive, Snell Street in that area. With regard to the stormwater design, is is there an effort to make sure that you know some water is being pumped in there? Yeah. To, so preserve existing absolutely. conditions. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're we believe we're complying with all Massachusetts stormwater standards. We've got subsurface infiltration systems here with uh, an overflow in, into this area right here. So um, we have a motion right now. If there's any other comments, if not, we can take a vote, and then we can also help Chris summarize just the general comments that were being accompanied with this recommendation. Any other? I see no hands. So at this time, we'll vote on the motion that's on the table. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. I see six. No. And abstain. And one abstain. Um, so Thank you. that is that. So gen and help Chris and I if we're missing anything. You know, there's architectural suggestions, there's wetlands, there's road design, there's parking layout, uh, recreational area or issue. Um, am I missing? Uh, I think landscaping was good. It's like Ma management of yeah, the go. parking that is on town property, how it will be managed. Right, right. A little more detail to if it's going to be metered or permitted or snow plowing and maintenance. Um, so, may I just yeah. reiterate that? List? You <laughs> said um, architectural suggestions, wetland issues, roadway design, um, recreation area. There was something in there that I missed. Uh, parking, 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 design, and then management of um, parking on town property and what else? I, w I would say more parking and parking for guests and more for tenants and then a parking management plan that collects data and can be adjusted if it's inadequate. Because we can always do shared parking and other alternatives. And I'll just add and if parking could be looked at on the east side. Am I, any, any other issues that we would want them, or pros? I won't have an opportunity to really send this around for your review. Um, we need to get comments yeah. to the ZBA for tomorrow night. So you're comfortable with this list? I'll probably flesh it out based on Ms. McGowan's memo and the comments that you've all made. Okay? Is that good? All right, thank you. Thank Great. you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you very good much. Luck. Thank you. Uh, so we move to item five. This is another review and discussion. SPR 2019-07 and SPP 2019-04, Amir Michi, Southeast Street co Court Housing, 133 and 143 Southeast Street. Review of proposed changes to a previous, 
previously approved project to determine if the board will entertain the changes that were required to bring the project into compliance with the Conservation Commission's order of conditions issued in October 2018 and to consider whether a new site plan review application for these changes should be submitted for a three-story mixed-use building with 57 apartment units, 1,200 square feet of retail space, and associated site improvements and work in the town right-of-way. B-VC Zoning District, Map 15C, Parcels 3 and 4. Um, Yes, Chris. I just wanted to say something about why we're here. Um, the Conservation Commission uh, reviewed this project back in 2018 because um, the applicant was about to have an expiration on his wetland delineation. Wetland delineation is good for three years, and he was reaching the end of that time period. So um, the applicant did the best he could with a uh, site plan and presented that to the Conservation Commission, and a site plan was approved. Then he came to the planning board, and the planning board asked for um, changes with regard to um, potentially adding more parking spaces, which he did. He added parking spaces in the southwest corner around that driveway um, that comes out of the site, and he added um, more recreation space at the northwest corner of the building in response to um, concerns of the planning board that there wasn't enough recreational space on the site. So then um, we suggested that he go back to the Conservation Commission because this was different from what the Conservation Commission had reviewed and the Conservation Commission did not look favorably on these changes. So um, he went back and uh, decided that um, maybe he could lose the parking, the three parking spaces that he'd added in the southwest corner and shrink the recreational space. And I think he's gone back to the Conservation Commission with that plan. Um, Mr. Um, Lou can probably elaborate on that. And the Conservation Commission has, um, does like that plan, that revised plan. So now they're back in front of you, and um, they're asking you if you agree that the changes that have been made to the plan that you approved are satisfactory you have a choice. You can say, no, we don't like the changes. You can say, yes, we approve the changes tonight. Or you can say, um, maybe we'll approve the changes, but we want you to submit a whole site plan review application and come back to us with a public hearing. So those are sort of the choices that you have before you tonight. And maybe Mr. Liu can elaborate on the exact changes and where they occurred. OK, so we know why we're here. Um, if you could introduce yourselves sure. to... Um, yep, Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group and Mr. Amir Mikchi, the owner and developer of this proposed project. Um, Chris gave a his short history and I'll point out the areas in specifically. Um, but yeah, we did get conservation approval in 2018 um, for the... This plan shows an overlay. The red lines represent what was approved by conservation in terms of the limit of work. I'm so, um, yeah, bigger. Is it, is yeah. it, which one is it? This one? Bigger. Okay. Bigger. <laughs> is that bit too big? And get rid of some bookmarks. How do we get rid of this side? Click. Yeah. No, go to the oh, other right side. <laughs> Who's driving <laughs> here? Okay, we don't want all yeah, this go to the top. extraneous yeah. stuff. Oh, that works. Yes. Good. I guess now I'm going to have to go down just a bit. <laughs> okay, whatever. We'll pan around. So this heavy line represents the limit of work that was approved by conservation, and it goes up through here. Um, this area down here was the replication area that was outside the limit of work. What is underneath here, basically in the what you see in the black, all the black lines, is the plan that you approved as the planning board. So I'll start with the parking area first, because that's probably the most contentious. But here, this thin line, th uh, this thin red line, represents the edge of paving that conservation approved in 2018. Uh, sorry, it, oops. 
Can you see this yeah, thin red? Just move the mouse along it and we can, yeah. Red line. Do you want to get up closer maybe? Okay. And then so in the course of the review and redesign of the project from, from the parking standpoint, we ended up with this line, this dark, this black line. We added a retaining wall along this side and then tied it back in basically right there and tied it in right there to what was uh, approved by conservation. So that resulted in the paving being closer to the wetlands than they had previously approved. Um, up here in the northwest corner, this red line, the heavy red line, represents the limit of work that conservation approved. In the course of review with the planning board, we added this lawn space in the northwest corner and we had to grade it out to kind of flatten it out to make a decent yard space, this kind of like wedge-shaped area. But this um, kind of dashed black line represents that revised limit of work. Again, that this area uh, encroached further toward the wetland than was approved by that board or that commission in 2018. They asked if we could put it back the way it was. And we said, well, we can do that. Planning board has, is going to have something to say about that too. So we went to conservation, presented it, and all. They, I just received this today, the conservation's approval for this as a minor change. So they're approving of, um, well, I should put up the other uh, plans actually. Hold on a sec. Can I ask, Chris, did we, we didn't get a copy of that. Or did? Is it in our packet? No, I meant the letter. I meant yeah. the, the letter he had. Okay, no, I meant. I just got it by email this afternoon. Okay, just making uh, sure from, I had um, Aaron it. Jock. Uh, but we met with, with them on February 12th um, and presented this, th these plans. These are a revised set of plans, L2, L3, L4, and L5, um, that include um, the revisions. What we had done, as you can see here, is we put the road back to where it was. We lost some parking spaces. We put this um, uh, limit of work, essentially, what we did was we put a little retaining wall here. It's only going to be about 18 inches high so that we can flatten out um, and provide a smaller lawn area, if you will. Um, and additionally, to kind of, because the site's already been disturbed, um, this area that used to be lawn, you know, the loam, loam has already been stripped, as you probably are aware. Mm -hmm. um, some construction had started there prior to the winter. So we also did this uh, native planting buffer to fill in that space, if you will, beyond the um, retaining wall and um, small yard space. So what happened was um, when we put this back, we, we had three um, parking spaces along that um, stretch of road that you had approved. We have a net decrease of two spaces because we were able to get this one more space here by reducing the size of this traffic island. Just by the geometry, we could fit in one more nine-foot space as it so happened. So we have a net reduction of two parking spaces from 67 to 65 spaces on the site. And what is proposed is that we basically um, reduce the visitor parking, which I think at, we presented as being visitor parking being 10 spaces, I think it was. 12. Was it 12? 12? Okay, 12. So now we would have 10 visitor parking spaces um, without changing anything else in, in, the, in the building or you know, anywhere without trying to re, you know, massage this plan any more than we can at this time. Can you show us where those 10 spaces are and where those 12 spaces I believe are? they're right here. Does that yeah. say 10 spaces? Yeah. Yeah. So these would be the, this is essentially where we had the visitor parking spaces before. And then we right. also designated those three spaces that were over here as visitor parking, I believe. Yep. Or something like that. But I think that these would um, essentially function as the visitor parking spaces. Again, we had the two um, handicap spaces here. I think four uh, spaces were needed to be for commercial, and then we had one zip car space, you know, um, at, in this last slot. So basically, the remainder of the lot here, all these spaces, would be reserved for the residents. 
So that's, that's the simple way out of this, if, if you are agreeable and would approve. Um, Janet? So, Mr. Liu, I, I'm a little bit of a loss of why we did not know this information in our four or five meetings earlier about the line that the Conservation Commission had drawn. And we were, how did that happen? You know, I, I don't really know. Um, I mean, know? It, it was, it was we, we, we knew that there were changes that you requested. We brought that to the former conservation agent, and we got approval. But the new conservation administrator, the agent, um, in reviewing this plan, as Mr. Mixi was gearing up for the construction, noticed that the plan was different than what she had on file. So she brought it to the Conservation Commission's attention. We went there informally and talked to them about it, and they said, no, we want you to put it back the way it was. So this line, this red line, existed in 2018, and right. you were just not seeing it, or? I think that we, well, at the time, we felt that it would, was not a, um, they, that these weren't significant um, changes, because they're, they're actually, well, the lawn space, that was already in a space that was already grass previously, so we didn't think that was um, So you, you didn't think that change. the line by the Conservation Commission was significant. Could you explain to me what these other lines are? Like, I, can, I can't hardly eat, read them. Like, are they setbacks from wetlands, like the same kind of buffer zone lines? Uh, which lines? I don't know. Just I'm looking at the lines around the thin red line. How Janet, do, would a magnifying pan? glass help you if I gave you one of the? Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm, I, Janet, may I? Um, Please. Ms. McGowan is talking about the grading lines on, in the northwest corner. So if you can show a grading plan of that northwest lines. corner. I think, yeah, a lot of that is topography. Those are grading lines. And then there's a new plan that has other grading lines on it, or it has a wall instead of grading lines. Yeah. So I guess I'm frustrated that we were working for many sessions on a map that wasn't reflecting what the Conservation Commission wanted. I would hope that would be your job to tell us. Um, so the other thing I've heard is that um, there was no pre-construction meeting with the conservation agent before um, the site was altered. And then also there was problems with the sedimentation barrier. So I, I just have some concerns about how seriously you're taking this these issues. We are taking it very well, seriously. Mr. Please, Michi. please let me. The, the, no, we were taking let, it very seriously. Let him finish that. And uh, what happened was that you know, we uh, went through so many things. And I had the construction, construction lined up. And the night that you know, we got the OK from you, uh, the impression was that you know, we can go ahead and start doing the site work. We started to, and I, that was the understanding that I had f uh, from the other people. Other people, I don't mean all those people in the street, people who are you know, responsible. And when we started you know, the, uh, taking off the looming, because we were eager to start before you know, we hit the uh, 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 ice, uh, then we were approached that, you know, we have to have this, uh, and we cannot even, we have to have a meeting. And we were in the process of having the meeting. And Rob told me, no, we have to wait till, you know, we really have the right of way approved. Because right of way is another section that has to be approved by the town council. So the whole thing basically stopped. So it wasn't that, you know, we would try to, uh, uh, do something out of ordinary. We were basically, we were, I was eager to basically start the construction to make sure that we wouldn't lose the time, which we end up doing it, which we end up losing the time. But it, for your uh, information, Mike also was, uh, when we were showing you about these three uh, parking, we talked about uh, with the t uh, person who was in charge of conservation at that time, you know, she gave us the indication, according to my understanding from Mike, that it was okay. So that was the reason we keep, you know, developing what we did. So there's an order of conditions and in, in like, 
capital letters, it says. Yes, they are all, uh, uh, and, and we are all. Are, are you familiar with that the in the pre-construction meeting? We follow the conditions. There, I believe there's a condition that says that if any changes to the plans are made, that it brought, be brought back to the commission to see if they are substantial enough or, or I can't remember. And exactly also the pre-construction so. meeting with the conservation agent and then the whole process. I mean, this is very ordinary and it seems. Well, it, it did occur, let, but. Let her ask all of her questions mm -hmm. and then you can address so, I'm just so we don't have to. Sort of expressing know. my dismay that of these, the turn of events and I feel like it's concerning to me. To uh, I can't give excuses, you know. The, the contractor was eager to get started, but we did have a conservation, uh, a pre-construction meeting um, with Aaron Jock. Mr. McCheese hired a, a third party um, wetland consultant to do the weekly reporting that's needed when the construction resumes. Um, things have stopped at the site. The site's been stabilized. He's put in temporary seating prior to the snowfall to stabilize you know, the, the site, even though there's no sediment leaving the site. Um, there was a cease and desist order, but I have to be frank with you that um, Miss Jock saw some tire tracks on the site that were, were they, they were from basically a truck that was delivering the um, um, erosion control sock. Um, she mistakenly thought that it was dumping something in the wetlands but that was not the case. But she issued a cease and desist order, which from which we did go back to conservation and tell them what was going on out there. Um, the, con the contractor's been put on hold to his dismay. Obviously, he's had this project, you know, lined up to try to do foundations and stuff, but um, he was prevented from continuing because of the cease and desist. Um, and further review, we, uh, we learned that we had to go to the design review board for the work in the right of way so that they could um, render an opinion, um, advisory opinion to the town council. That happened, we only got to the design review board last week. Um, Mr. Bert Whistle, the representative of the planning board was there. Um, so that's still another process that has to happen in terms of final approval of work in the right of way. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I know what to say. We, we realized that there were changes to the plan when we came to this board, um, but we did go to conservation and ask if, you know, these were substantial and we were told no in, you know, in that person's opinion, they weren't. Um, and we complied with the, uh, the new agents, um, recommendation that we stop and, you know, go back to conservation, have a review. We came and had multiple meetings with uh, the conservation agent and Chris to see how we should handle this. We went to conservation first, as I mentioned, on February 12th. After they gave their approval, then we asked to come before the planning board informally to present these changes. Okay. So we're, it's basically, you know, if you, if, the, if this board um, approves of the changes back um, to, a plan with lesser paving, um, you know, we, we hope that that, whatever, we can get an amendment of some sort. Okay, so um, here you, so a bit of a rocky start, mm -hmm. some lessons learned, there's good intentions here, everything's being tightened up, so conservation has, the CONCOM has made their suggestion and it's coming to us to right, decide whether or not. Right, because we have, we have to be working not, with the same plan. Right, yeah. like it's too much of a change, no, or it's, um, it, we can accept it and with or without some other suggestions um, or the other thing would be that you'd have to come forward with a whole new SPR filing. Right. Um, Maria? I see that plan that had all the red lines overlaid showing um, what was approved by planning board and then what con, con yeah that one. So it looks to me the building is mostly the same. It shifted slightly. Like you said, you lost the three spaces and you gained one. So it felt it's a loss of two overall. Mm -hmm. And then there's just the slightest change at the northwest corner. But 
Mm -hmm. Overall, it's the same project in my eyes. Um, I don't know if any other planning board members want to chime in with what they think the significant changes are, but um, in my mind, it's still essentially the same project. And that's as far as site plan review, we're seeing whether it's the, you know, appropriate for the site, detriment to neighbors and abutters, and it's, you know, and it's still doing all of that. So in my mind, it's still the same project. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, it, it's um, two spaces and a, a bit of trim on some of the grass. And it, yep. I, we have met with you so many times. I would be a bit horrified if we had to go all the way back to the beginning of an SPR all over again. Um, I agree with you, Maria, that it's not significant, so we should look hard at what is changing right now, which is two spots. Parking was uh, a heavily discussed issue when we approved this. Um, so the two spots, it's two guest spots have come, have been lost. Any other, com Doug? Do you feel that the loss of these two spots will adversely affect your operation of the building, whether it's the attractiveness of the units for rental or other uses? You, uh, we have four spaces for the retail, and from what you heard from Mr. Roberts, Barry Roberts, about you know his experience and the people before him about the use of the you know, parking. And these are you no know, one bedroom intended, you know, for the people who are, you know, we, I really don't think uh, having two lesser, you know, visitor parking would have, you know, dramatic effect. I also just want to remind the board um, that we have uh, extensive indoor bike storage, outdoor storage, it's on public transit. Um, <clears throat> there's single bedroom or studio units um, that, all right, how many of, remind us how many are already gonna have no parking? 12. 12 of them are already no. I, you have a parking management plan. I, I just have to stress on that, what we talked about before, that if this is a problem, I mean, we're making an educated guess I know that you have plans for more development across the street. You know, a little bit of what, you know, Janet was saying earlier, it, that it has to be watched, data has to be collected, and if there's a problem emerging, then a new parking management plan has okay. to be developed or tweaked. Janet? So we didn't require data collection. Do you want to add that now? Because that's part, that the bylaw lets you says you can ask yeah. for that and then do revisions afterwards. So maybe that you know it, you're saying it is kind of an experiment, and if it's not working, it should come back maybe. Right, like uh, like a year, you know, a year into it, they should do a couple of parking. Well, the, the bylaw sort of says regularly ch checking and updating and ensuring that you know um, car use is being reduced. That's what the language says. Or, well, I don't know if car is usage being reduced. It's more just like, is the lot being optimized properly, sufficiently, and not at 100% all the time? So we or didn't ask for that. identifying that what the data collection can do is also identify. It's not like it's going to be maxed out all the time. It's just where are those peaks that aren't being addressed, um, and then having alternative plans. But, Chris, you had your hand up. I assume you have some <coughs> guidance here. Well, I was just going to say that um, you can't really add a condition or okay. um, embellish a condition unless you open up the site plan review again. Oh, yeah. um, and you wouldn't have to open up the whole site plan review. This would be an amendment to the um, site plan that you approved already. So if you were serious about wanting to change that condition, you could ask him to come back with a site plan review application to amend. Um, and alternatively, you could make a request, and I could include it in the letter when you approve, if, if you decide to approve this, I could include it in the letter, and if um, Mr. McChee is uh, amenable, he would, you know, you could ask him to come back in a year to present information, and that would be um, 
really not something that you could enforce, but it would be kind of a good faith, uh, to use a term that Mr. Levenstein doesn't really like very much. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Don't put it in the minutes, right? Um, good faith effort to provide information. So, I'm for that for a suggestion that a uh, you know that a year because I would you know we're actively trying to analyze what is happening and part of the mm -hmm. problem is we are making guesses and you all are going to be the guinea pigs. So I would like to make the request that a year later um, and uh, you know even if you maybe made a request of there might be a new parking down like a parking committee or something like that that could help you to just give you like the times but i think in truth i'm comfortable with that because the problem really ends up on your plate like you know it it's it's not that really affecting mm -hmm. us it's that your neighbors will be complaining and coming to you and saying there you know there's cars overnight here or um, there's people on the street are taking our other parking. So you're going to feel the pain before any of us do. So um, I, I know y you're trying to figure it out because you're going to have other building that you want to do, and, and you're going to want to get it right. You're n if you're making a mistake, you're not going to want to repeat sure. it. Um, how does the board, how does that sit with the board um, making that request to the owner about giving us feedback a year later on how's it, how it's working? And I guess that would be a year from it opening, we should probably say. So it's yeah. not really a year. It's a year yeah. from when you open. Are, are you going yeah. to manage Doug? the property? No. Your question, how does that sit with the board? Does that, is that well, an invitation to a motion or what? It could be. What is that? that yes, I would love a motion. Um, uh, or it, it, a motion, <laughs> a motion. Uh, a motion. Uh, I'm, don't want to feel emotional. No, I'd. Um, okay. It could be a motion, but if anyone didn't like that idea, they should speak now or maybe say a motion. All right. Having. Oh. oh. I think before we get to a motion, mm. uh, I have a question about another aspect, not the parking aspect. And to make sure I'm in the right place, uh, Chris, what we're being asked to approve is the, is the plan approved by Conservation Commission October 2018. No. What are we no. being asked to approve? You're, there's a packet. Yes, the revised, revised plan. plan. That was revised because of what ComCom, ComCom has told them they need to adjust back. Mark L2. It's just revised plan. That's yeah. what we're looking at. This, okay. Yep, this one. So it's this illustrative yep. plan. Yep, okay. and this plan. And, and, and the plan. substantive changes are in the northwest corner. There's a retaining wall rather than grading. Mm -hmm. uh, in, along the southwest corner, there are no parallel parking spaces. There were previously three along that curve. And there's one more space cut into the island. Uh, those are the three changes to this site, as I understand it. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, basically. Well summarized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, looking at the, the northwest corner, uh, what is that object between native plantings and lawn area? Is that a retaining wall of some kind? The, yes. Yes. This. How is, high is that? It's and 18 inches. 18 I think. inches. <clears throat> So That's 18 that inches high. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the grassy area, the lawn area, it looks to be about 10 feet wide. 16 feet wide. Hmm? It's 16 feet 16? from the building. Yep. From the building to the to the uh, wall. To the wall. Okay. Um, that's um, significantly smaller than the already small area that the uh, planning board asked for. Uh, in right. our pre one of our previous meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that request was at least in part due to uh, public comment, uh, people asking for more recreational space. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just concerned by the loss of two parking spaces, but as has been pointed out, that's, in a sense, that's your problem. Um, but um, the loss of the, of the recreational space maybe is our problem. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how, 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 whether that's a really big deal or not, but it's, 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 it's something. Um, and um, I think before we um, 
vote to approve this uh, revised plan, I think we ought to think about that. Jack? Isn't, uh, isn't there an exercise room in the yeah. floor unit? Generally, okay. Got, There's a huge gem. Four units. That's uh, each unit. Is 600. So four yeah. units were turned into gym. Four units, if you speak in, so. Yeah, four units were turned to the gym and a bike rack, bike storage bike was one. And also we are adding, which is not part of this, but uh, the package storage so that you know and I next. just want to remind everyone so if you look at the little triangle piece up there that we're talking about that gets lost and then compare it to the huge park area that is in front of the building I I don't you know I think and lawn is not a green element honestly um, if people want to be outdoors and hanging out, I think what's left is still large enough for one or two picnic tables back there. Um, and then they have all the space in front of the building in the new public park. Could, Janet? Could, could we just run through what the original square footage was and then the new one? Just I, I think I missed what was said earlier. The, the square footage that's lost is what you want? What it started out is and what it's ending up as. So. Well, if that's 16, maybe you can help me, um, Michael, here, or other I'd have architectural to, engineering people. Uh, boy, I'd have to measure it out on a plan. Um, okay, so 16. It's about 16 by 50. Is what's it left. Is what we're, yeah, is what's yep, on the screen right now. So that is approximately 800 and, yeah, square feet. And that di like diamond piece would have been probably and like 14. This, so this would be 16 plus another. 30, but then cut it. Probably uh, 40 by 14 by a half. So 20 by 14. About um, 280, no, is that right? Four, 300, yeah, good. 400. So call it 300, we're losing about 300 square feet, square feet and, and from. And 800 remaining. That's very general, but that's. Yeah. So there was about 1,100. We've got um, 800 left, and we lost about 300, rough. I can't remember, and that was just rough graded out, like it was just going to be dirt going down. Well, like, uh, or did it have a retaining wall there? No, there was no retaining wall. Yeah, we we basically it. flattened it out, and you can see these two contours here, which indicate like and it was going to just that, drop. That would um, be getting back to grade at the 30 foot no disturb wetland buffer line. Were they concerned about erosion there too? Now that I'm thinking nope. about it, I hadn't really. Nope. Because you'd have to plant bush or native plants on well it something has to go back there yeah. you know now because it's been disturbed right um, but you're going to have this low retaining wall right and then right. you'll just plant yeah. bushes and stuff and actually some comments were made that they felt that that would be a attractive feature for people to sit on the wall I, you know yeah to, as an Ooh. additional kind of gathering Ooh. could of, it be a uh, sittable wall oh yeah yeah uh, i like yeah. that rather than just the retaining wall down it would yeah. be nice <laughs> Only if you fall. Only if you fall that way. Yeah. Fall on the grass, <laughs> not down into the wetland. Um, that's a nice so thought. So that gives so people a, a chance bench. to sit and do this all day long. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yep, Jack. I just um, uh, obviously we don't want to get this right moving forward. So you, when you came up with the plan to increase the parking at our request before you came in here you ran it by Beth no we ran it by or after after yeah all right well, we should well, do that before right well, I wish we did, but, like, you know it's not something that like every time we come to one board running to the other board to recount what happened and you know I mean the typical procedure is to see what we end up with and then go back and say this is what the other board requested. Is it substantial? 
But I, I know from experience that, that that agent has a lot of power, and if it's a different person, then it, 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 yeah. it's all total different yep. uh, uh, game, basically. So I, I understand that part. I understand part. that, too. Any other <clears throat> um, comments? Anyone want to make a motion? In the interest of time, <laughs> keeping so a motion to accept this altered plan as a motion to accept this altered plan with the additional request that a year after occupancy the applicant come back to the board with some parking uh, <coughs> census counts for our information. So moved. Someone want to second it? <laughs> no, it was good. I'll second. We're all getting tired. I hear a second. Since Dave said all it was right. good, I'm seconding it. So now we have the motion on the table. Any more comments, discussion, concern? Can, can I just remind the board that uh, Mr. McShee, I believe in your parking plan, has stated that he was going to hire a professional, you know, property manager. That's, so that yeah. entity that would person. be you kind of used to looking out for, you know, illegal parkers and that type of thing. Um, so I don't, you know, it wouldn't be difficult to have them that person or do some counts. You know, do some yeah type of counts and stuff as a routine it's not hard um, any other questions if not um, we can take a vote uh, all in favor um, I see I do <laughs> one two three four five six six uh, against not in favor uh, abstain all right, so there you have it. Thank you so much. Move forward with caution. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Oops. do we need to take a, a bathroom break? Or it looks like we have a zoning subcommittee report we have, we already did, uh, then we have just a signing of a decision. I'll ask this, do we have ANRs or none? ZBA applications or SPP, none of that? <laughs> we wanna hear not much now. <laughs> so, okay, I think we can. If we don't have those, then this, this is doable. Unless Maria goes on for a really long time on that zoning oh, subject. I'm going to talk for hours. Okay. I want to be here until um, midnight. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to item okay. so what what is that? A six, planning and zoning. Zoning what? subcommittee yeah. report. Let's see. We met yesterday. We did. It should be fresh on my mind, but I'm so tired. Um, so we discussed action plan. Um, we strategized. We um, appreciated your memo, Michael. And we thought, okay, what are some things we can tackle that... Um, Thank you. Are things we can tackle as a zoning subcommittee versus things we need to hire consultants versus things we might be able to get the planning board to weigh in on. So for not, uh, probably for the next planning board meeting, we're hoping to bring in front of the planning board the priorities chart again to start talking about which initiatives should we hire a consultant to really take on and just fix. And then on top of that, we also, um, have some initiatives that are small bites, small chisels that we think we can do as a zoning subcommittee and push forward to town council. And one of them, the first one that is really pressing is the planning board voting requirements. So we will discuss that. The uh, zoning subcommittee voted two yes, one abstain to bring to you guys at the next meeting to discuss this zoning amendment that we want to promote, uh, propose to the town council. Um, so we have a lot of things in our basket of, you know, things we want to work on, and we're just trying to prioritize them because there's so many. But we do want to pull in the planning board's opinion into all of this, and so we're looking for guidance at the next planning board meeting to see, right, which items we need consultants for, B, which items we should just push forward to town council and see which items as zoning subcommittee we can work on and tackle in small bites. 
Um, I think that, oh, and then also we talked about the master plan update very briefly as far as Christine's working with Brianna to do this website to capture public input in a really easy interface that then we can sort and use that data and, you know, really be able to tailor it to like how we look at that data in a really informed way. So that, that's really exciting. Um, I reached out to her today by email. Oh, good, no. good. Okay. Um, I think that was everything we discussed. I don't know. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. Question about that. Yes. Uh, will we be able to get the uh, written work on what we're gonna you're gonna have ask the planning board to think about? Will be will will we be able to have that in writing before the meeting? Right. As part I, of our packet. I, I, I did update the priorities chart and sent it to you, Chris, either yesterday or today, and so that will be part of the packet. I hope. Um, so that will be the thing we look over together at the planning board. And then the other piece is the planning board zoning requirements amendment, which was drafted like two years ago. And we ho hoped we could push forward to town council as one of the first things that they could, you know, take on along with supplemental dwelling, but that never happened. So, um, what, what happened with supplemental dwelling? Well, remember we had zoning subcommittee had three articles. Yeah, I remember. Ready, and, what happened with um, that one though? They all just, just there's some new information, like things have changed. That needs to be rewritten because there's new data and best I think practices. David was working and on David's it. David's working on it right now. It's been a couple of months since, but Michael, you had revised the supplemental dwelling unit amendment. I believe you had advised to, to make it, to, to have the, the, the size requirements slightly larger, right? And so that's what the graph was that we were working from. Then um, I proposed to conform the supplemental dwelling unit as revised by you to the proposed governor's bill, which was very close, and so just to kind of try to make them conform. And as soon as I started digging there, it went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> And now I've got like two or three different sort of alternatives because it's gotten, believe it or not, a little interesting. It, it is. And and so that's 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 the state of things. But that's was in December. I really haven't looked at it since, and I could be forgetting something that's material. But it is being worked on. Right. So those are the kind of things that I think the zoning subcommittee could take on without a consultant and we can mm -hmm. bring to the planning board, vet it, and work on it, the way we used to with articles to town meeting. So part of um, us working on some uh, zoning bylaws to change, I do believe CRC is meeting, I think, next week. It's soon, and they are finalizing their process on how they see how they're going to, um, them and town council are going to get zoning bylaws approved. So, um, you know, I think we pretty much know what we need to do. We come up with uh, what we want is sort of like what used to be an article, now it's an amendment, and we will vote and we recommend it to them to approve. So, um, the thought that they're getting closer to actually having a process is a good thing because I think they'll be more receptive to receiving our work and that should be coming to us I think I had asked the chair of CRC to send us whatever her draft is for what she's going to be sending to her CRC members so we'll get it at the same time we don't meet for like another week but at least we'll be able to see what they're talking about yes she, does she want comments from us individually or she just? She doesn't want any comments at this point. It's totally okay. in-house. It's for discussion only with them. But I asked as a courtesy, could we at least get like some eyes on it so that we can start thinking and, and prepare for our comments. I think it will be very similar to the last time. I think she's going to come with um, the uh, assistant town manager and they will, you know, tell us and bring, bring it. But at least this time we'll have seen it a little bit sooner. There's another very complicated flow chart, so get excited. Um, all right, uh, so it, it, uh, is there any public comment or anything else here? No, no one's got, okay. 
Uh, so we can go to item seven, old business. If we drop to B, it's decision signing. Chris, I believe that's Riverside Organics. That came through for us. You finally have Riverside Organics ready to sign. I sent it to you on Monday evening. Yeah, you did. And um, so hopefully you'll be able to sign it. Um, there are two places for Ms. Uh, Gray Mullen to sign and one place for everybody else. So I'll, okay. I'll pass it down the line. Great. And I'll pass it in its little blue jacket here because there's also um, minutes from November 20th, which you just approved, and we oh. need Ms. Gray Mullen to sign that. Okay? All right, great. Um, topics not reasonably uh, anticipated, 48 hours. Is there anything? Okay, great. Oh, you have something? Yep. Yeah, I want to put something on the table, so to speak, and just see if it flies or not. Would it be possible to start our meetings at 630? We can talk about it next time. Just thought I'd put it out there. I'll just leave it. It was that wouldn't have been a possibility, except because zoning subcommittee was always before. It used to not be a possibility because zoning was but, before, and, and I'm now not it's moved. Totally sure that zoning subcommittee is staying that way. We will have to talk to the chair and and see if that's going to be a permanent change. I think it will be. I think even staff is appreciative of spreading it out so so you said six or six thirty or you oh well I wasn't even gonna dream about six but this is a this this you know I can tell this is gonna be a hardship for me if these meetings go this late every time so unless we can find a way to make them go faster I, I would do what I needed to do to get here sooner I, just putting it on the our, table if we could shrink our so yeah let, so everybody will we'll add it to the agenda on the next time everybody think about that what would that mean if it started at 6 or if it started at 6 30 let's leave it at that okay great yep good thought um, new business anything for it nothing for, okay and ANRs you said no um, ZBA applications Okay. Um, so Hampshire Athletic Club is going to go before the CBA. They are requesting a special permit to modify an already existing special permit, actually two of them. Um, they're going to alter and expand a pre-existing non-conforming use by constructing two one and a half story building additions to the existing wood frame building and provide a new roof dormer at the center portion of the existing gable roof. And additionally, they want to change their hours of operation. And when is this coming to them? Well, um, thank you. So, uh, do we have any uh, SPP, <clears throat> SPR, SUV? Did I tell you about the um, driveway and uh, flag lot on Bay Road? Maybe I told you, you about told that last us time. It was coming. It's coming on March 4th. Oh, so, right. Um, okay. That will come to you. And then um, on March 18th, you're going to have a scenic road hearing. Um, for trees on, I believe it's Leverett Road. So we'll be bringing that to you as well. We'll Not East Leverett, Leverett Road. Tree removal for the scenic road hearing, okay. yeah. So we will have to um, set up a site visit for both of those. So okay. I'll be writing to you about that. Site visit, thank you. Uh, Planning Board uh, Committee and Liaison Reports, uh, PVPC, Jack. Uh, I'd like a half hour to discuss the last meeting. <laughs> Can you sum it up in like three minutes? <laughs> no, uh, okay, so what we did, uh, we, we had a presentation on the rural policy plan. That's a new thing. Oh, uh, yeah, that's and, yeah. and that defines Western Mass, yep. basically, because there's only like three uh, or four municipalities that are truly urban. But interestingly enough, Amherst is like, we're kind of a tweener. Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're our tweener. density, because of the, the students and all that, we're closer to, say, Holyoke. And yeah. we're like two or three times more dense than 
than uh, Northampton. So it, it's just, it's, it's odd, but definitely Western Mass, this is where Western Mass needs, you know, an advocate, you know, with, with the Boston-centered, you know, capital, with the East-West Rail, uh, just getting, you know, communication and services out here. It just, it, but the, the, the thinking was that Western Mass has a lot of potential that can take relief off of the eastern part of the state if, you know, transportation uh, uh, is, is better um, and the sea level keeps rising. <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but then they went over the budget and, and what the towns actually provide is just, it's, it's so little. And it's all, these regional planning commissions really get all their money from the state. Uh, and what, oh, we have, I, I can copy the 10 uh, resolves. Oh yeah, can, Chris, can you yeah. send those Did you get a copy? Of and we can add that to the agenda item for the next time okay. for anyone who has comments yeah. or. Yeah. So that's it. Top 10. This to me, uh, okay. Jack, you yeah. okay. Oh, great, thank you, Jack. Um, CPA? Yeah, CPAC has finished its uh, deliberations and uh, is in tomorrow in the stages of making its final report. Uh, it, it won't uh, be of uh, great surprise to anybody. Almost all the projects that were proposed were approved with the, with the uh, question on the uh, um, a large, a large a request for um, from uh, Amherst, Commun Amherst Municipal Housing Trust, uh, and uh, that was cut down. Uh, and um, the issue of the um, support for library historic preservation uh, at a million five uh, is um, under serious discussion because it was reduced to a million by the committee, and now there seems to be some question as to whether it's even possible given the uh, state regulations for that particular um, uh, kind of project. So that remains to be seen, but that's going to be dealt with tomorrow, I think. Thank you. Agricultural Commission, did they meet again? No. Okay. Uh, Design Review Board, Michael. Uh, we uh, looked at the uh, dog park, which we all have seen tonight. We looked at the, uh, the road issues in front of the uh, uh, Mr. Michke's project that we looked at tonight, we uh, approved uh, that area and we heard from uh, the uh, new director of the Amherst bid about a um, proposal for uh, raising a significant amount of money to build a performance shell on the town common uh, in the uh, place of the original uh, Olmsted um, 19th century plan. Um, and that, uh, that was just informational as opposed to uh, asking for action. Okay, thank you. Uh, we already did the zoning subcommittee. Report of the chair, I have nothing. Report of staff. Some good news. <laughs> the planning department has hired somebody Woo! to help us. Yep, he's, a, he's going to be a graduate of UMass. He'll only be working with us part-time, about eight hours a week between now and June. But once June comes, he'll be working with us full-time. And he seems like a really talented, energetic, curious, good fellow. And we're really counting on him to, um, to take up some of the load that we've been carrying. <laughs> so we're really looking forward to having him full-time in June. Does UMass have a, does UMass have Sorry, a, his uh, name is, um, his name is Ben, Ben Brager. In fact, he used to work for um, Dave Zomek uh, back in, a few years ago, I think he worked so doing something for the Conservation Commission, and he grew up in Amherst, and his, um, his dad is on one of the boards and committees, but I can't remember which one. Maybe the CONCOM, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he's got a, he will have a degree in landscape architecture and regional planning, so he's got a lot of graphic skills, and he's also got presentation skills, and he's um, got a really great personality. So I think you'll enjoy working with him. Great. Father may be a teacher. I'm not Does sure. Does he do 3D models? 
He probably can do three. I, I mean, sketch up. I mean, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he can do sketch up. Well, that's a different category. I'm sure he can do that. Yep. Well, uh, then why don't we use uh, it? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Move we adjourn. Yeah. Move and second. All great. Thank you, Amherst Media.